We're giving away more free bets than ever before. Get a free bet on any race on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Hello everybody, welcome to a wet, wild and windy Cheltenham. We're on the eve of the Cheltenham Festival. It is the point to which we've been working all season on road to Cheltenham and Ruby Walsh. It's gloves off, opinions out. We're going to be coming, going through all the main races during the course of the four days. If we can hear each other over the wind. I know, it's a very blustery morning here in Presbury Park, Lydia. And um, it's wet, it's damp, the ground is going to be sticky. And that's going to change a lot of opinions. It is going to change a lot of opinions. We're also going to have the declarations for Wednesday during the course of the show. There'll be loads to talk about. And to that end, we have a third member of the team today. As is traditional, we are joined by Nick Luck. We'll be getting all of the interviews during the course of this two-hour show. Nick. Lydia, this is one of the most exciting days of the year. Before it all begins, and you really know you've arrived at the Cheltenham Festival when you come alongside this just awe-inspiring group of horses that have come here from Willie Mullins, it's Clasutton base. And this is just about a quarter of them, 23 in this little lot here. Paul Townend, the stable jockey, what a week it promises to be for him. He's riding Sir Gerhard, white cap there, who runs in the Brown Advisory on Wednesday. Paul says he feels in good form and he certainly feels he's got the class to give a good account. Just reading further back, we've got Ampere Pass at the front of the lot with an Ergumen. And right at the back here, whipping them all in, well, who should that be? It's Daryl Jacob. He rides for Willie Mullins in the opener tomorrow, but he's on Bron here. He's whipping in this little lot of 23 horses, but that is just the tip of the Mullins iceberg. More from me in a few moments' time. Back to you guys. It's uh, blowing a fair old gale down here. Yes, and we've come to the safety of the grandstand. We're a little bit more sheltered from the wind, happily. Yeah. We've got couldn't, the best I couldn't see me lasting two hours out there anyway. <laughs> You used to be a hardy type. Used to be. <laughs> we want you to get involved in today's show as well. And so we have asked you a poll on social media. And that is, which of these festival hot pots do you think is the most vulnerable? And this is Road to Cheltenham. Why? So is it Constitution Hill in the Champion Hurdle, Jerry Colomb in the Brown Advisory, Shishkin in the Ryanair, or Galapin Deschamps in the Boodles Gold Cup? Get voting and we'll be talking about it. Who would you vote for there? Um, I don't know. I suppose there's two ways of looking at it. The unknown of the trip for Gallop and the Champ, I don't think it's a worry, so probably wouldn't vote for him. A real testing ground for Shishkin, but he has won on soft ground on a number of times. I think the conditions are going to suit Jerry Kalam, and I can't imagine anyone's going to vote for Constitution Hill. Those are Ruby's thoughts. More importantly, not more importantly, just as importantly, what are yours? Right, we're going to get on with things. We're going to start with Tuesday, it seems obvious. So let's start with the Sky Bet Supreme, shall we, and have a look at the betting. Obviously, we had the declarations yesterday. Fasal Viga is the favourite at 2 to 1. Marine Nationale at 7 to 2. 5 to 1, Il Ton, and 10 to 1, and upwards the rest. The obvious place to start is the fascinating Fasal Vega. Let's start with his uh, defeat of Il Ton in December. Yeah, this is Leprechaun on a Christmas grade one hurdle. He let a tomp and elected to make the run. And Danny Mullins went to the first hurdle, jams on, goes right. And Fasal Viga lands up on his inside and goes to the front straight away. So uh, that's how that race changed. He went along in front. He was a little keen on this occasion, but nothing compared to what he was like at the Dublin Racing Festival. And he was just too good for the opposition. Ashra Diamond is back in third. She'd come from well off the pace. Pat Deru is in fourth. He's a subsequent winner. But look, that was a decent performance from Fasal Viga. You were hoping there was more in the tank. We certainly believed in Winnie Mullins as there was, but um, we didn't get to see it the next day. We didn't. Change of tactics this time for Fastel Vega is what we're expecting. That he'll, he'll be ridden more patiently than both yeah, of them. Yeah, they were Willie's comments after the race, so you'd have to expect that that's what will happen. Obviously, he went to the Dublin Racing Festival then and basically went to do what he did there. Only was high definition when with him, and they went much too fast. Well, let's see what High Definition did around Christmas as well. He made his debut over hurdles. It was quite a, a taking debut as well. It was a decent time, this. The form's working out pretty well. It, it was, but his jumping wasn't spectacular. You saw him going right there, the second hurdle. Um, second last, this was the last hurdle that they jumped on this occasion because the last was out with the sun. 
and he was yeah it was a good performance from him he keeps going really well he was only doing enough in front and um, we watched it at the time Lydia and you could you were wondering how hard is he been on himself Jatara chased him home uh, behind that was Parmenion who's gone and won since he was obviously second to uh, found a 50 at Ferry House and found a 50 was second to Corbett's Cross since but look the form has stacked up uh, there's a few winners back there Diversion the Maroon and White Stripes from Ria Pose. he improved to win as well so look plenty of winners came out of this race and high definition was a high class flat horse your one worry for him would be Galileo real testing ground that's definitely an unknown he's two jump runs have both been at Leperstown which I don't believe will be as soft as Shelton was going to be this week you don't think his jumping out to the right and not technically sound is a worry no, it is a worry but I'd be more worried about the ground for him OK, fine. Right. I would imagine he's a lot of school and done. He was better at the Dublin Racing Festival. He had way more school and done since. I'd be more concerned about the ground for him. You mentioned Diverging the backwash, who then came out and was very impressive. He's wearing a tongue tie for the first time. Yeah, and he's by Frankel. Um, so you'd be kind of wondering, look, for a Galileo and a Frankel, is this really going to be their conditions? Dry March, you'd have been thinking, yeah, they'd be two horses to have in their shortlist, but in a wet March, I'm afraid you'd have to be against both. So we had the big matchup, didn't we, um, at the Dublin Racing Festival, and this is where Fasal Vega flopped. Talk us through this complicated and interesting race. Complicated? It was fairly straightforward. Um, Fasal Vega jumped out down the inside, high definition again, clumsy at the first hurdle, but it's more now Lydia from here. This is the third hurdle, the second hurdle away from the stands, and it's how fast they go from here. But if you watch Danny Mullins in the yellow colours on the grey, il était temps and how far he's going to drop off the two in front as they power around this long bend into the back straight. Danny's dropped right back there to fourth on the outside. High definition, just unlucky there, stumbles and unseats JJ Slevin. But Fasal Viga runs out, of, runs out of steam really quickly um, at the third last hurdle. In the pocket is behind him, and Ilete Tomp is the one that arrives galloping over him. And look, Ilete Tomp is an obvious runner here, Lydia, yeah. and a big runner at that. Um, and he's a massive player, I'd say, Ilete Tomp. But I think the real Fasal Viga will turn up. He'd be delighted with what we've seen at home from him since. He'd be delighted with how he looks on the gallops here this morning in Cheltenham. Dark Raven are in the pocket are second and third there, and they're going to take the, those first three are going to run again tomorrow. So um, it's interesting, but I'm, I'm not going to desert Fasal Viga. I think that's probably behind the not really believing or the betting not seeming to believe Ilete Tom's win there which was really substantial form for himself he's a second season novice again I think there's some prejudice against him for that he can be keen though and he can clatter the first hurdle and if he did that in the Supreme he'd be in trouble yeah he could um, but he'd still expect in high definition to be ridden pretty similarly to how he was ridden on his two jump starts so there will be pace in here there's a couple of more like to go forward as well and um, there's a first for everything, but I've yet to see a slow supreme. Is Diverge likely to be one of the ones that goes forward with high, high definition? I'd imagine he'll go for a position, but mm -hmm. I couldn't see Diverge forcing a strong gallop. Mm -hmm. OK. And so, I mean, I know that you, you felt that they went too, too hard at that point, but it's not so hard as to really totally explain what Fasal Viga did. Afterwards, Willie Mullins mentioned that he was lame, and you've downplayed that. You don't think that that was relevant? I'm not so sure it was. Um, so many horses would pick up bangs and cuts and scrapes and nicks that they'd be lame after their own and he hasn't missed any work since. You could say, yeah, that's the excuse. I'm not so sure it was. Is it possible he's a stayer? By out of Quivega and won a heavy ground bumper at the festival last season. Is he a classic Supreme horse? Yeah. Stayers win Supremes. We're going to find out whether he wins the Supreme this time tomorrow or shortly a bit, little bit later tomorrow right let's break off from this discussion and go and join Nick Lydia Ruby thank you David Casey assistant trainer to Willie Mullins is with me now um, David Lydia and Ruby just discussing the Supreme and obviously hurdle Ruby quite simple stayers win the Supreme Fasal Vega could be a stayer but the most important thing is is he in one piece is he sound and hearty enough to do himself justice and run to his best yeah, I think he is, Nick, and David Porter rides him most of the time at home, but I've been looking enough last week, I rode him his last two bits of work, two very, very good bits of work. Um, he felt in really good form, and he looks brilliant here. What did he work with? Um, I can't remember exactly now, but I can, but I won't say, but it doesn't matter. But no, but he, he worked super um, both times, and he was in great order, so uh, really happy with him. He looks super. Um, walk around there this morning, so um, we're really happy with him. So in your mind, if you were Paul Townend, would it be a no-brainer? He just simply would have to be the one you rode? To me, he's he's the best horse in the race, and looking at the performances he's put up before, I know he blew out the last day, but I would be definitely for forgiving any horse one bad run, and I think what he's done before, I, I'd have to stick with him. And how much is he let a time improving? 
Yeah, but he's improving plenty, but he, he is a second season novice as well. You know, he had all those runs last year in grade ones and one he's made this year and stepped up. But, you know, if, for me, I would just have um, Fassel probably ahead of him. I think he has that extra bit of um, class, I suppose, about him, maybe. And the, the boss is, is giving it large about Diverge with Patrick on. Do you share the confidence? Yeah, he ran very well at Leperstown um, in a good maiden behind high definition. He improved plenty to go and win. Probably an ordinary maiden, but he won it very, very impressively. So I think there's definitely more improvement to come from him along that. And he's got that bit of speed as well, which, which will help him. We can't, don't worry, we can't go through every single Willie Mullins horse. We <laughs> simply haven't got time. Well, there's it 74, I think, was the final tally, was uh, it? There's, there's plenty anyway, yeah, definitely. So, um, it might be a something buyer at 74. Something around there, yeah. I mean, logistically, has this been a lot more complex than in previous years because it seems to have mushroomed again this year yeah it's obviously it's, it's the most we've ever had so um luckily i don't have a lot to do with that side of it i let the lads at home grani in the office looks after that pit so um she does a good job in fairness what you do need to do is make sure all these horses are right and ready every morning just seen paul town and they're on so gerhard and he said you know he's got the class if if this is the right race for him is the brown the right race yeah i think the, the thinking was that the fact that he's only had the one run over fences um, with that little bit of lack of experience that going three miles, going a little bit slower would help him through the race. But, um, you know, I, I have every confidence in the horse. As I say, he's been to Cheltenham twice and he's won twice. So I, I wouldn't look beyond him. And, and Egerman is out in this a lot here, isn't he? And yeah. we were just talking about the ground. How much do you think this weather forecast is going to tilt the balance in his favour? Yeah, well, I think when you saw what the weather was like last year on the Wednesday and, you know, the performance he put up, and it's, it's, it's definitely going to be a huge help to him. All right, and who's Patrick going to ride in the bumper? I can't believe you've only managed to find 10 horses <laughs> for the bumper. I haven't spoke to him actually about it, and they're all declared, but um, I would be surprised if he didn't ride either Factifile or It's For Me. One, uh, one of those two, but I'm not certain which yet. I'm going to speak to him now about Yeah, it. but when he walks up to you and says, right, Casey, which one of these should I ride? What are you going to tell him? Well, for me, I suppose Factifile definitely has the best form in the race with his seconds um, to John Kiley's horse at Leperstone, whereas It's For Me is only one of made made It Could be anything, um, could be special. Um, but it's hard to know. But simply on the form, Factifile has the best form. Does he normally take your advice? No. <laughs> there you go, right. Uh, and of, of all the horses this week, which one in your heart are you most looking forward to seeing running? For whatever reason, whether they're one that you're very attached to or it's a particularly big race, which one excites you the most? Uh, I think Empere Pass in the Ballymore. I think there's so much under the bonnet that we haven't seen from him. Um, I think he's going to be a fabulous horse. Is he in the right race? Yes. Does it matter which race he was in? Um, I think two and a half is his, probably his best trip. Perfect. David, you've been a star. Thanks so much. Super, Nick. Thanks. Talk to you soon. That's it. You got it from David Casey. What more do you need to know? I think he's told us plenty there. He's suggesting Factor File might be the likeliest horse that Patrick Millers goes for. What do you think? I probably would as well. Age, stamina. I don't think the race in Epperstam was going to suit him. Um, I think with the rain, the ground, yeah, I, I'd go for Factor File too. Not had the betting sees it or has seen it. Betting is only an opinion, Lydia. It is, it is indeed. It is that's in all ours is as well, is an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly, the Clasutton opinion seems to be on Pere Pass. You know, bearing in mind the way that Fassar Vega towered over the novices reputationally at the start of the season. Now, in recent days, it seems to be all about on Pere Pass. Yeah, he's uh, declared in the Valley more, and yeah, his work has been very good. He's a Moscow Flyer winner, one of two, three maiden hurdles just before Christmas, and he was very impressive. And yeah, he's, he's work at home has been good. OK, I think just one last word about Afasar Vega, just because I think this is the horse that the whole of the Supreme revolves around. Some people will be out to get him. Some people are still true believers. The rain will have helped with his extravagant action, won't it? Oh, big time, yeah. Big time, definitely. But the clever people probably will wait for the arc and have a bet. Yeah, you, you can get sucked into a Supreme, can't you? We're going to carry on being sucked into the Supreme and we're going to move to the British runners. We'll start with Tamuris, who's the winner of the Tollworth. Yeah, and look, the rain definitely going to help him. Uh, obviously, Nolan won a Tallworth and came here to win the Supreme, uh, and I think he's improving. He really impressed me at Haydock when he won Tamuris, and he was good in the Tallworth as well. Handy early, they quickened in the middle of the race, and Harry Cobden let the race away from him, and then they came back to him and fluffed out through the last, OK, but then grounded out. And Look, he's going to have to dig deep to win here tomorrow, whatever it is anyway, and this fella looks to have plenty of, of guts and determination, and, yeah, look, he's a good horse, Lydia. Mistake at last, idled, hung a bit. Young horse, I wouldn't really be too worried about it. He's jumping up to the last hurdle in Sandown. They've been very good and I thought he jumped really well at Haydock. Idled in front, he'd be fine. Yeah, you made the point that it can be, unless you're Constitution Hill, difficult to be impressive at Sandown. I, I think it can, yeah. I think once you're not slowing down to me, you're, you're doing well at Sandown. 
So many, that's many people's idea of the best British runner. It's certainly the market's idea of the best British runner. My idea of the best British runner is actually rare edition. And we can have a look at him comparatively with Constitution Hill. They ran over two miles at Kempton on Boxing Day, and we've compared them with the horse who's expected to win the champion hurdle. Yeah, look, and rare edition led the Christmas hurdle to the first, but by the time they got to the fourth, which is midways in the back straight, Constitution Hill has gotten in front of uh, the novice hurdle in rare edition. And as you would expect, he's in front of it by the last hurdle. But what where... Uh, the novice is, is in front of Epitant. <laughs> mm. So, look, you, you, you're, trying to, you're comparing different races and they're all run differently, but it still shows the rare edition can run to a high standard and he ran to a, probably a higher standard than Epitant did in the Christmas hurdle. Yes. We'll talk about how Epitome was ridden that day, but I, I think it shows the quality of rare edition that you know that that run I think with the double penalty as well shouldn't. And there was be an excuse then for Huntington his yes. last start, so you can forgive any horse one day, and they had a valid excuse. So he's definitely a big runner. Another one that likes to be close to the pace. Yeah. He was close to it at Kempton, so you can see him up there beside or close to high definition anyway. He'll be a strong stayer at two miles as well. He actually had two excuses for his defeat by Marble's hands at Huntingdon. One, a some issue with his back and also a dirty scope afterwards. Let's have another look at the betting and pick out anything else that we should mention. We haven't discussed Marine National, National yeah. and we really must. Now, he won a Royal Bond, which was very strongly run, and he was the last one to challenge, overcome came a mistake at the last. Yeah, and on similar sort of ground. Um, I know the ground was the worry for him going to the Royal Bond, and that's the reason he hasn't run through the rest of the winter, is that... Barry Connell is adamant he doesn't want real testing ground. Unfortunately for him, he's not going to get nice ground at Cheltenham, but he's a very good horse, Marine National. Michael Sullivan rides him. They can't use his claim, but I don't. Technically, it's a disadvantage, and you have to look at that. But I don't think Michael O'Sullivan is a five-pound disadvantage to anyone. Neither do I. And we'll, again, that theme will come out later on when we're talking about the stayers' hurdle. Love the bigger prices, say like Dr. Bravo. Do you have yeah, any? Gordon is sweet on him. Good run in the Red Mills has a step forward from that. Um, good run in the Maiden Hurdle at Leperstown at Christmas time as well. But he has to come forward, I think, from the Red Mills. But the vibes are that he has. Okay. Right, those are our thoughts about the Supreme. Let's move on to the Sporting Life Arkle, shall we? Much smaller field, just the nine of them here. John Bond, the favourite, at six to four. El Fabiola next in at thirteen to eight. Dysart Dynamo nine to two. And we start by taking a look at what I think, and I think most people think, is the strongest form going into this race, and that is the Irish Arkle won by El Fabiolo. Yeah, it is, and it was a cracking contest, Lydia. And look at him going to the first. It looks more like a race run here in the UK. Everyone bounced out to go forward. San Roy lands in last place, but it was just the pace of this race. How quickly good horses got outpaced and got so strung out. Uh, Dysart Dynamo rocked along field door and San Roy and. And Visionarian, who'd all who'd been involved in the Grade One and Leopards on Christmas, were out with the washing so early. I look, and this is going to be what tomorrow's race is going to be as well. You have Dysart Dynamo in again. Now, Will Fabiolo made mistakes at Ferry House. That was a pretty bad mistake there again at Leopardstown. But to me, I love that he knows how to get his feet out. Yes. He's made a mistake. He knows how to survive. 2-1 at Leperstown takes plenty of getting. But Il Fabiolo had the gears to always be in control of that race. He was always travelling well behind Dysart Dynamo. And I think he's going to at least put it up to John Bond, if not really make him go. I actually think he will make him go. Um, I think he's a really good horse. I think he almost beat him in a novice hurdle at Liverpool last year. And I think he'll get his revenge tomorrow. Yes, he was having just his second start there against John Bond. Also got some interference three out, didn't he? Yeah, he, he did. And he's only his second run of his life. Now, you could also argue that John Bond had had this, the, the simple task of following Constitution Hill around in the Supreme. So he could have underperformed yes. last year too. Yeah. Um, at Ancient, there's no doubt about that. But um, it'll be a good rematch, Lydia. And this sport's all about rematches. He did come straight back on the bridle after that mistake. A mistake might be different here, potentially. Yeah, it depends. Like, look, we're looking out at the track behind us. Like, you clout the first down the back and land out in your head. It's not as easy to get back on the bridle. Mm. You drop your hind end in the ditch, climbing the hill. It's not as easy to get going. Leperstown is more level. But that's the same for everybody. There are certain fences that are not good to miss here. Um, and they'd be two in particular. And particularly that fourth last, the ditch up the hill. That's not a good place to make a mistake. Let's talk Dysart Dynamo. That was two mile one, 11 fences. He'll be have less than two miles and 13 fences for the Arkle. Does that give him, because he's such a good jumper, some advantage or more more of a help? I don't think so. I just think that the, the riders will still go. The ones behind them will still go at him. They'll just go at him earlier. Um, in Leperstown, Darrell didn't take him on until he was turning in. 
like I think they will go at him from the back of the third last fence tomorrow. It, it, to me, when you come down the trip, it just means the other jockeys go at the horse in front sooner. Um, and I, I, I don't see the drop in trip being of any advantage. That's interesting because in a minute I'm going to move on to that, that, that an angle that that produces. But with Dysart Dunner, Danny Williams was try, trying to get him to be maybe less exuberant. He was hoping that the set out, the layout of Cheltenham might help him do that. Yeah, well, four fences pretty come at you pretty quickly in the article, but it's going to be testing ground. Danny's still going to be wanting to be watching the clock, but I, whatever way you look at it, 68,000 people here tomorrow, they're going to be clocking yeah. over 30 miles an hour up yeah. here the first time. Yeah, and I, I just think, personally, that Dysart Dunner really has one way of going. Right, so they're going at each other. El Fabiolo, John Bond and Dysart Dynamo from three out. Does this set up the race for the horse that unseated Mark Walsh? It, it could do, but I think he'd still... San Juan, by the way. San Juan. I could, it could do, and at eight to one, he's the each way angle in the race, but I still think he will only end up in each way angle. I don't see the three of them falling in a hole. I think, yeah, one could, and then ultimately a second one will in the dying, in the dying stages, but I still think the best San Roy can get to a second. I can't see him winning. Yeah, uh, I see that. Maybe he was a better each way angle before the decks, before we knew there were just uh, this many. Anyway, let's see. Um, oh, no, there were nine. I was thinking there was going to be seven, but there are actually nine, aren't there? Yeah. Um, it was seven in the champion hurdle. Um, OK, so let's have a look at John Bond, shall we? He was in the Kingmaker. Um, and people didn't like this run. What did you think of it? I didn't mind it. Uh, people crabbed his run in Haydock last year as an office hurdle or two before he came to Cheltenham, which wasn't spectacular, but I, I didn't crab it. Uh, look, some horses are front runners and some horses are followers. John Bonn has had to make the run in his three novice chases, but I don't necessarily think he's a front runner. This is him at Sandown beating, beating Boot Hill. I mean, Aidan Coleman opened him up in the straight that day. He was really impressive. Like, that's John Bonn's form. Yeah. And the way what he did to Boot Hill at Sandown, unexpected party back in third. Um, that's the level he can run down. Watching him there, he can probably run to a bit more. Uh, Nicky Henderson running February in the Kingmaker. He'll have only had his eye on tomorrow. And I think you'll see a much better John Bond tomorrow afternoon. And I think Dice Art Dynamo will make John Bond a better horse. This is Calico went by him really early for some reason at Warwick, and he came back by him. But he was workman like he was, like he was in Haydock last year. Oh, he's a big player, Lydia. I thought Aidan Coleman was quite happy to allow Calico to go past him at that stage. And people are talking though about his jumping out to the right, and that he, when schooling, even goes out to his right. When we talk about going out to the right and how it is a disadvantage, particularly on the old course, will it be for him? I think if he does it, it's marginal. I don't think it's. I haven't seen him go. Whoa. That's exactly how I feel. I just think it's marginal. He jumps a fraction to his right all the way. That wouldn't necessarily, but there's different ways of doing it. And people say, well, you said that about such and such a horse. He's, he's jumping his marginally to the right. It's like he wants to land on his off four rather than on his near four. Well, I wouldn't be too worried about it. You made the point about Corte Star before. Yeah, you? and I, I always thought he, he did. And yet he won more race at Kempton, but he always uh, jumped to his uh, left. Mm. OK, let's have a look at uh, the betting one last time and see how things stand. So, I mean, I, I feel like El Fabiolo at this stage should be favourite, but John Bond hasn't budged. Oh, I think it's a great race, and it's whatever side you come down on. Are you a Willie Mullins fan, a, a, a Nicky Henderson, Aidan Coleman, Paul Townend? It's whichever camp you want to be in. It's, it's going to be brilliant. a fabulous race, yeah, isn't it? It is. Yeah. I look, I'm obviously El Fabiolo, and that's biased. There's no point in saying anything differently, um, but I'm with him. I'm John Bon. I think El Fabiolo will make him a better horse. Uh, I, I, look, this is, to me, this is uh, this is a race to stick your neck out and have a go. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I'm so much looking forward to the Arkle. So many years it's the Arkle that really gets the blood pumping. The Supreme will be fantastic too, of course. And later on, on the first day, of course, we have the champion hurdle. And could we see the kind of performance from Constitution Hill that means that he is propelled past the likes of Isterbrack? Maybe even Night Nurse? Well, we'll have to. He has to win the race first. He hasn't yet been crowned. That's the point. I know you're shaking your head at me, but oh, he has put please, up three what, outstanding What difference is it going to make so what number they put on him? It's what he does tomorrow. Bloody it, numbers. Do your head in. 1 to 3 Constitution Hill, State Man 130, 14 to 1 bar. Right, let's start with last year's Supreme, which was absolutely set up for Conscious Constitution Hill to wow us. Yes, and on good ground, or on actually on the drier side of good, I'd even say. Uh, Dice are dynamo booked out, and John Bond kept him extremely honest all the way. And good horses were made to look like slow horses in this race from so early on. The Constitution Hill was jumping, was brilliant. He was always close to it, Dicer Dynamo bows out at the third last and uh, Nico de Bonville just kept it so simple. I think he'll do the same again tomorrow. I think he'll ride this horse so simply. He was spectacular in this race. I didn't walk out of here last year believing what I watched, 
it was only after he won in Newcastle and then won in Kempton that I believed what he is. He is a brilliant, brilliant racehorse. I hope he's lucky enough to become a great racehorse. Yeah, since he has put up to not not as brilliant as this, but highly substantial, absolutely top class performances in winning the Christmas hurdle and the fighting fifth prior to that. Yeah, and in open company. Because whatever way you look at it, that's only a novice. And he's gone and done it now twice in open company. I hope he comes back here and wows everybody in a champion hurdle. Um, it'd be great to see. How how do you see the argument that he? actually hasn't had a great deal to beat in that uh, Epitant was ridden slightly defensively, understandably, against her stable companion and actually that State Van has had the more difficult tasks this season? I don't know. I thought Nico uh, gave Constitution Hill a pretty straightforward race at Newcastle and opened him up at the fourth last before they turned in. Is that long since it was in Newcastle? I think there's three in the straight. Um, but I think he made him go and do enough. It's not Constitution Hill's form, fault that he's that much better than everything else um, I think no I don't, I don't think that the prep is any wouldn't bother me in the slightest and for two mile hurdlers anyway no and Nico de Boinville his ride if you were he what do you think that you, you would do I mean is there any is there anything that he's worried about or is he just going to keep it very very simple and even go on if he has to very simple and you just look at Nico's record here on yes. really sharp price favourites Altior um this guy wasn't that short, but Altior on a couple of occasions when he was really short. Nico just doesn't get rattled. He keeps things very, very simple. And Nico de Boinville doesn't lose on horses that should win. Agreed. Right, let's have a look at the Irish champion hurdle. And this is State Man, where he took Honeysuckle's crown and he set out in front. Yeah, look, tactical race again. And Paul took the, scruff, took, took the race by the scruff of the neck, dictated on his own terms. Honeysuckle outside him, Zana here, Pipe Piper, Vaughan in behind. It was a race that built through the race, they did. It didn't go that quick early and it's built up. And he's a, he's a decisive winner. Um, and he's only done. Done is the right word? As much as. Was as it did done as much as Paul uh, asks him to do. He doesn't. He doesn't go for everything. He just extends him enough to win the race, and he and he wins quite cosily. Uh, I think looking at the race is probably more relevant to Honeysuckle as to how you judge her more so than how you can judge Statement because I think if there was better horses in here, you would have probably have saw a better Statement. I think there's a bit more under the bonnet, but don't think there's enough under there to be constitutional. And by contrast, Vauban was disappointing compared to his previous start. Weren't you expecting a bit more from him, albeit he probably didn't have track position? I, I don't think so. I just think Stateman was the one that improved more. I think Vauban was a good winner of a triumph, but he's still beating Pipe Piper pretty much the same distance there. What does Paul Tannen do? Sh Other than pray? Yeah. I, you know, to be honest with you, he just rides his own race. What, 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 he can't go out thinking, well, there's the weakness or there's the flaw in Constitution Hill because none of us know where that is. Maybe someone does. If they do, please text me. Let me know what you think the weakness is. Um, <laughs> but I don't know where it is. So I think he just has to ride his own race. And his own race is? Simple. Uh, I think looking at it, you might get I like to move it going forward along with maybe uh, Jason the Militant. And I, I'd imagine Paul will be right behind them with Constitution Hill. OK, we have one more bit of evidence to have a look at in the champion hurdle, but first, we'll join Nick. All right, Lydia, just in the background there, you see the chestnut um, walking around with Jackie Mullins. That's It's For Me, who's one of ten in the champion bumper for Willie. And now Patrick's getting on It's For Me. So is this the indication that this is going to be his ride, I wonder? And is this going to be breaking news? Because we were just saying, Willie, we were talking to David Casey, he said... If it was me, I'd probably tell him to ride fact or file. I said, does he listen to you? He said, no. So he'll do, he'll do what he wants. He's just taken your yeah. counsel there, I think. Yeah, we're just chatting away, but he, he got up and it's from me there. But um, we'll decide a bit later. I, I've got to go and have a chat with him now when we're going back for a cup of tea. All right. Yeah. What would you do if it was your call? Um, that, the way the weather is, ground, the older horse. You know, it's going to be edging towards uh, older horse in this ground. Be stronger, I think. Okay. Yeah. So, of the of 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 the ten, um, we're just given an indication as to which one is the is the likeliest. But who do you think is going to take the biggest step forward? I, they're all stepping forward. Um, fun, fun, fun. Probably could step take the biggest step forward because I, I didn't think she was ready in. You Lepistan. didn't fancy her at all at Leopardstown, no, did you? No, no. And and when she blew up. Going down by the last ditch, I said, 
that yeah, we expected her to blow up. And next thing she just took a breather and then she just came back on the bridle like she jumped in at the second last fence and motored up the straight. So I think she's, she's come here very fit. You know, she could be anything. So just in terms of numbers, like we were saying it's 70 plus, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, uh, individual it animals. Me the other morning <laughs> when um, I just don't count them, and next thing someone's happened to say, you know, we've we've 79 or 78 booked on the boat, so we've cut a few off that already, and I think there's probably 70, either 75 or 74 or five uh, booked to travel at this point. And 40 something here already. Um, uh, any any dramas or all okay none, so far? None. none. Uh, we were worried about the horses getting on the ferry this morning, but apparently they've all travelled. And um, th that was the biggest drama we had last night, wondering whether they, th the captain would take horses on the ferry this morning, but he took them by all accounts, anyhow. Yeah. You've had a walk of enough of the ground, I suppose, to get an indication as to what it's like. What do you think? Um, I mean, I. They're, they're calling it what good to soft is it? I think that's the official. I think we might have gone soft after four mils this morning. Right. Yeah. Well, we would prob probably call it yielding at home in Ireland. I think you, in England, it's probably you 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 go um, a degree better than we do. Uh, but knowing Cheltenham, it'll probably take some getting. It's it'd be dead enough underneath. So it will. I mean, are you quite happy with that? Would you, would you, if somebody had given you that a week ago, would you have said, yeah, no, yeah, I'll take yeah, that? I, I think so. Yeah, it's, it's safe, and that's the that's the big thing. That I'm I'm always worried just about having safe ground. Horses finish safe, riders finish safe. The slower the ground, the safer it is. So that rain has just come at the right time. All right, I asked David Casey a few moments ago. I said, which horse of the whole lot of all seventy, whatever. I said, which one's getting your heart pumping? Which one's exciting you the most? For whatever reason, whether it's emotional, financial, other. And he came up with his answer. So I won't tell you what it was, but what, what's yours? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I, I love Facile Vega, so, you know, I want him to run a big race okay. tomorrow. So I do. What do you think he said? Gallop and shop. Uh, he said Ampere Pass. Oh, did he? Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. So we're loaded in the novice hurdles, and confidence yeah. behind Fasal Vega seems to be really, really strong. Yeah, yeah he's, he's doing everything right. You know, I think we just, tactics were wrong the last day, and that's that. So I'm hoping he can just change tactics. Like when you see where he came from in the bumper last year, I mean, I thought at the top of the hill there, he had no chance mm. having to come through that wall of horses. He just, once he got into gear, he just flew. So, um, I think he'll settle well enough. You know, he's, he's doing everything right at home. Softly, softly. Um, are you feeling good? Yeah, fine. Yeah, I mean, everything is everything is going too well. Don't that, say that. Don't say. I know. That. <laughs> and that's it. But you know, all the jockeys are here. The horses are, most of them are here, and and the rest travelling. And uh, we've had no setbacks. Um, you know, so we just need need the thing to play out now, and hopefully, get a few winners. Good luck. Thank you very much. Cheers. That's Willie Mullins. And uh, Fasal Vega confidence just seems to be growing all the time, Lydia. <laughs> Spoken like a true pe pessimist, I thought, from, from, from Willie there. Um, 75 horses he's bringing over? He's uh, bringing over? But yeah. In 43 around, here already? 43. And, yeah, luckily, uh, luckily the boat stuck the rest of them this morning. So, um, yeah, they're all on, on route. So, yeah, big team of horses. And as David was saying, a huge effort from staff logistically. Poor Grani in the office, I'd say she'd be glad when Cheltenham was over. <laughs> and I hate to bring it back to Fasal Vega again, but I'm going to, just very briefly, because they touched upon whether he would settle again under different tactics, having been ridden very differently over hurdles. So would you be confident he would? I would, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would. I know, look, doctors differ patients die. Uh, I know Barry doesn't think he will. Barry Garrity, he doesn't think he'll put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, I think he can. And that's the beauty. That's the, There's me and Barry in two totally different opinions. Yeah, yeah, it is the beauty and everyone out there will have their opinions as well. Right, we need to have a look at I Like To Move It, British representative in the champion hurdle alongside Constitution Hill. This one for Nigel Twiston Davis. Tactics interesting. Yeah, look, this is him in the Greatwood where he was good and handy. This is him in the Royal Keel where he dropped in and didn't, not sat in, sorry, not dropped in, didn't run the same kind of race and then went back to Wing Canton for the Kingwell where he was up there all the way. Lydia, I thought this was really impressive. Mm. Didn't ping the force but these were flying. Now, much drier ground that we Canton on this occasion, um, Napper's Hill in front, and he, the ease at which he travelled, oh, every step of the way, and pinged hurdles, most of the hurdles. But I thought he was, I thought it was a good performance. And anti post when you had eight runners, I thought he was a, a huge price at 14 to 1. But only the seven now is probably not the same. 
punting angle to it, but um, he, he's a very good horse. Theoretically, I agree with you in terms of the level of his form. I think it was it was quite high. Yes, my glasses are falling down. Don't worry, it's fine. I, I'll manage. Um, <laughs> I, I, as long as bad. I don't have to read your notes, we'll be all right. <laughs> but my point is, the way he has to be written, the way he's seen to best effect going forward, that might mean that he's compromised a little bit in this. It might, but he'll be fit, and um, it, it might. And he might. He, look, I don't think he's quite up to the level of Constitution Hill or Statement, but he's still a good horse. And I must say that Wing Canton race was probably overlooked because the times were. It was a great race to watch. To watch the speedometer on it, the mm. speed they were going, it was mm. entertaining. It was a really substantial performance. Right, let's move on to the Close Brothers Mare's Hurdle, shall we? And this sees two previous champion hurdlers taking each other on. The title holder, Honeysuckle, is one of them. And she is second favourite at 130. Mary's Rock, the title holder of this race, is 11 to 4. Epitant is 5 to 1 alongside Brandy Love. We must start with Honeysuckle. We've already seen her run in the Irish champion hurdle. First of all, we're going to have a look at the Hatton's Grace, which was her first run and is traditionally her first run at the start of the season. Yeah, and look, you can expect any horse to improve from their first run. Obviously, this is the first time in her career that she ended up not winning a race, made a mistake here coming down from Ballyhack, which was slightly uncharacteristic of her and was always then, I felt, a little bit behind the eight ball. Classical Dream and Tihupu elected to follow her and on testing ground at Berry House, did they outstay her? I thought as she rounded off the home turn, she was going to go and win and win here. She started to pick up, but both Jack Kennedy and Paul Town and had her in her sights. And to me, she never gets that far in front, jumps the second last. And we did it at the time, Lydia. When you flick this camera and look at it from the inside, you could see that both Tihupo and Classical Dream were actually in front of her way sooner than it looks from where we're watching here. Um, it was the first time she got beaten, but look, to me, she ran somewhere, I think, in the mid 150s this day. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, right, well, then she'll improve from there to Leperstown. But when she went to Leperstown, I think she still only ran in the mid-150s, which wasn't a progression, and to me is actually a regression on her form. For me, with that Hatton's Grace, she's got like that zip. She couldn't get past Ashdale Bob as easily as she would have done in previous seasons. And then in previous seasons in the Hatter's Grace, the fact it was first time out has then shown. It wasn't, I didn't really feel it was that this time around. And we've talked all the way through this series, and we also talked last series, that we didn't think her level of form even last season was as good as the season before. No, but look, she is uh, not human. She is an animal, and she's entitled to have had a peak and be starting to yes. come down. There's no doubt about it. But if you were to give me one result, I would love to see this week. I would love to see Honeysuckle win on Rachel Blackmore. This whole place stand and applaud. And for the year that they've all had, I think that'd be, that's the result. I just don't know how it's going to happen, but I would love to see it happen. Yeah, I think everybody would love to see everybody. that. But it's a horse race, isn't it? Unfortunately. <laughs> and fortunately at the, at yeah. the, at the same time. And what a race it is. So what, what people are trying to get a handle on is how much she has regressed. Let's have a look at the champion hurdle from last year where Epiton finished second and would have finished closer, bar for a mistake at the last. Yeah, she would have. There's no doubt about that. Appreciate it. Anna here, not so sleepy. San Roy all behind her. Um, Epiton makes that mistake and Honeysuckle. And you're always wondering what was there. What there more there is only honeysuckle only doing enough um, and she won and would have won regardless of the mistake but it puts epitan closer so just two and a half miles bring epitan closer it might i'm not certain it will and um, it might i thought epitan was good in her last start at doncaster when she dropped down in grade but i'm not certain on slow ground it brings her by honeysuckle i think the two of them have slightly fallen back together yeah, I'm, I'm not so convinced with Epitant. Let's have a look at what is, I think, her career best performance, which is her first try at two and a half miles at Aintree last year. Yeah, it is. And it's Anna here again as with her. Now, you will notice in hour two and a half, when she raced away from the stands on this occasion, she got a little keen with Aidan Coleman. But it's Zana here who's going to the last with her. She's going to beat Zana here. It's Mom Morale who eventually finished the second. Uh, I'm not sure. And look, I'm not knocking Aintree, but Aintree form can often be a fraction misleading at times. End of term type feel. End of term type feel, yeah. And Zana here falls, he's going to be finished second anyway, but that's what she's beating is Zana here. And Honeysuckle was always able to beat Zana here. Her jumping has been really slick this season. It was really good the last day at Doncaster. 
Uh, I thought it was better at Doncaster down in grade than it had been at Newcastle or Kempton. Yeah, and I think she was ridden, and this isn't a criticism, I understand it because she's up against Constitution Hill, slightly defensively. When yeah, she's well, gone. you're probably right to achieve your best possible position yeah. when you go out against something like Constitution Hill. And for her, that was always making sure you finish second. Yes, yeah. So I suppose it's hard to get an yeah. exact handle on where she is, is the point I'm making. It probably is, it probably is, but she's not getting any younger and there's a few younger mares in here. Let's have a look at last year's form, shall we? This is Mary's Rock's defeat of Queensbrook, both of whom are players this time around. They've got to upgrade this form, haven't they? Or we assume they have. We assume they do, but Mary's Rock has learned to settle better as she's gotten a bit older, and she's a better mare this year than she was last year. Stormy Island made the run on this occasion. Martello Sky tell me something, girl, on the outside, and the fatigue will fall, brings her down. Echoes and Rain is there in the green and red. Um, you know, it was a good, a really good run. But this mare... To, has kept surprising me, Maria's Rock. I didn't fancy her on this race. I then when she went to Punchestown, I still thought the Irish mares would beat her. They didn't, and she's kept progressing. Now look, it was, I suppose, a slight curveball that she was declared here and not in the stairs, but that was to do with the ground. I think she's in the right race. So do I. If this, she was mine, this was, she would have been always have been going. Um, she will need to be better than this day, but I think she is better than this. Yeah, I think the Ralph Kill showed that. Showed that. Yeah. yeah, I think she, she, was, she was very good indeed there. And I think you've got fewer sort of pulling worries about that. Now, she finished in front of Epiton when they met at Punchestown, but that was very much end of term for Epiton, surely. Yeah, it was. Epiton had been here, entry, and then went to Punchestown, probably on her way home for her summer holidays, <laughs> and turned up in Punchestown. But, um, yeah, so I expect Marie's Rock... I think this is a great race. It I, is. I it, it's, a really, it's the deepest edition or, and best edition yeah. of, the, of the mare's hurdle that we've seen. How about Queensbrook, who chased her home? Yeah, chased home. She wears it well at Christmas and then beat Brandy Love at Punchestown. So she's obviously a very solid mare. If you're looking at it purely on form and through the form book and at prices, you're kind of wondering why is she wears it well 25 to 1. She beat her comprehensively in Leperstown at Christmas. And she will settle at the back of the field. She'll be coming home for an each-way angle. And I think there is each-way angles here. I think both Brandy Love and she wears it well are good each-way angles. I would love to have seen drier ground for Echoes and Rain. Yes, Echoes in Rain, I've, the trip worries me. I just don't think she'll make an uh, impact late. Like. Yeah, I think she's a better mare this year than she was last year. She's stronger. She's a great run in the Irish Cesar, which behind Waterville. Um, and she's progressed through the winter. I was taken by her in Ace on her last start. I think she will get the trip, but I do think she's a better mare with a bit of drier ground. And then there's the left-handed angle for Brandy Love, which I can see, but she even hangs, has hung left going left-handed. Oh, she's going to go left. There's no doubt about that. Unlike John Bond, this is what you call going in a direction. Yes, And Brandy yes. Love... She's a York Hill, isn't she? She is a York Hill, yeah. Um, and Brandy Love... So she beat Love Envoy last year at, at Ferry House, going right-handed, which is a big inconvenience for her. Thought she ran really well at Punchestown in her comeback run. She loved the ground. And she'll stay. She's a big runner, too. She wears it well. I mean, she ha did have that terrible fall last season. She did. That's left her quite hesitant at her hurdles. Yeah, probably no harm. <laughs> she was too much the other way. Right, And okay. slowing her down and making her a bit hesitant wasn't the worst thing in the world that ever happened to her. But I just had a huge price, Lydia. She's 25 to 1. I could see her maybe scramble into third if they, got, if, they got, if they all got at it too early. OK, you mentioned Love Envoy in passing there. She was defeated by Brandy Love at the end of last season. She'd won here, of course, the Dawn Run, and this season she's come out and upgraded her form. Yeah, it can be a bit keen, though, uh, Harry Fry's mare. Johnny Burke dropped her in last year in Sandown on this occasion, but before he got to halfway, he's gone second, and he was in front by the time he jumped the last down the back on her. So she will have to settle. She handles the ground, she stays well. Very good mare, and I know Harry Fry and uh, Kira de Holler in high regard and they know what a good horse is. Can you give any chance to Theatre Glory, who has been supplemented and is very, very progressive? Not for me. No, no. OK, just thought I'd ask. Thought I'd ask. So you're likeliest winner of this fascinating race is? I'm not sure about the winner, but if I was putting my hand in my pocket, I'd be back in two each way, and that's Brandy Love, and she, and she wears it well. OK, you heard it here. Let's move on to some of the supporting races on the opening day's card. We've been talking about the juveniles all season, so it's right that we should talk about the Boodles, Fred Winter, which is always a fascinating race and really difficult to unpeck. Tip Cow is the favourite at 130. Biker, who you mentioned a couple of weeks ago, is 11 to 2. 13 to 2, Bad, who's a lot of people have been talking about him, 10 to 1 bar. 10 to 1 bar. And the app application of cheek pieces on Biker as well, Lydia. Um, I thought he was a little unlucky at Nace on his last start, so he's a big runner. To KO, great run at Leperstown behind Gallimard, so and lost him out. He sets the standard anyway. OK, we'll break off from our day one chat to go and join Nick again.
It's Lydia. The, in the Boodles, everyone's looking for the horse who's been hiding their light under a bushel or one that's well handicapped from the flat or a horse that's never run here, who's been in France. Forget all of that. Just go for the one that's been winning, like Sir Alan. Andrew Slattery's brother Francis is here. Uh, and Amy Jo Hayes as well, who's been riding the horse out a little bit and is a big part of the team. Uh, Amy Jo, I better come to you first. Sir Alan, what kind of form is he in? Has he come over? Well, since he's been here, he's absolutely flying his shy. I rode him out this morning and uh, as soon as I came around the home turn, just going around the gallop, he took a little turn and he, he wanted to go up that hill, but he's in some form and he's in some nick, so hopefully, a bit of luck. Now, you're, you're a princess on the flat. How are you enjoying your, your experience at Cheltenham so far? Oh, I love it. It's actually my first time away abroad with a horse. And Is it really? Yeah, I can't ask for much better than Cheltenham. And it's not impossible that you'll be walking into that winner's enclosure. I don't want to get too carried away just yet, <laughs> um, Francis Slattery. You're looking at the race clinically, dispassionately. You've beaten some of these horses above you in the market. What are you thinking? I think the, the, the horse is entitled to have his chance here. He's, he's, he's done everything right so far. He was unlucky not to win the first day. You know, the horse that beat him the first day is almost favourite for the triumph. Mm -hmm. So he's entitled to take his chance and hopefully he does it in style. I mean, from what Amy joe has been saying and, and from, from what you're saying, he, he sounds like a pro. He sounds like the right sort of horse for a roughhouse race. Yeah, he sounds like it. You know, every, the conditions here will suit him. Like, and you know, everything, every, everything. If he gets a clear run, we're, we'd be hope, very hopeful for him. And do you think the ground with this little drop of rain, quite a, a, a testing sort of racing, that'll suit Amy Joe? Yeah, it'll definitely go in his favour, anyways, and he'll just stay galloping, and stay going. As soon as he put his foot to a hurdle, there's no stopping him. <laughs> uh, it, it's, <laughs> he enjoyed it a lot more, like over the jumps. So he ran the flat and won in the flat, but as soon as we turned to a hurdle. He jumped and loved it. So. Do, you, do you school him as well? Oh, no, I'll stick to the flash. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to see you here at Cheltenham. Um, Francis, for you and for Andrew and for everyone of uh, the team here, what, what would it mean to you if Sir Alan were to, were to make a bold show of it tomorrow? Oh, it'd be phenomenal. Like, this, this is our first runner as, as trainers here, our first runner. We've had plenty of ex-horses here with likes of Cool Line and Cool Esprit and Faheen, and we've had all them through our hands. But to, be, to have one as a, 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 out from our own yard would be phenomenal. A little bit special. Well, best of luck to both of you. Thanks so much for talking to me. Um, fingers crossed for a big run then for tomorrow in the Boodles, Fred Winter for Sir Alan for the Slattery team. I still can't believe we lost. Oh, I was half an hour changing me whip, for God's sake. But look, you're still thinking how, how, do, how, do you not, how do you not win from there? Did you just get tired, really? Were you out the night before? Oh! <laughs> ah! It was literally, it was that like close. the last three or four yards. That was oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, God, how close that was. So, this was I a good loser? No, I wasn't. But that doesn't mean you don't say, what did I say? Well done, please come here in the shot. <laughs> 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 We've got one more race we're going to have a look at from day one, and that is the National Hunt Chase. Now, Churchstone Warrior sadly wasn't declared because he is lame. What a shame for connections. Uh, very short price favourite here, Gaillard de Menil. Yeah, look, he should handle the ground, Lydia, and he's run in last year's Brown Advisor. He's going to make him really hard to beat here behind Long Press and a high senior. I think a reproduction of that wins. Chemical Energy would want it drier. Mahler Mission will jump and go and make it honest. Manila Crooner will stay all day. So will Tenzing at a biggish price mm. uh, each way, but I just think the class horse here in this particular contest is Galliard de Menil. You've got to have your eye on the national as well, haven't you? If, if you if you fancy him for this, and the, the market does, he's got a, a national entry. Yeah, I ran in last year's Irish national. Mm. Um, made a mistake at the second last. Yeah, I suppose, Lydia, but I think I'd say his season has been geared towards tomorrow, maybe not four weeks' time. OK, interesting. I quite like Marla Mission in that. Right, we're going to move on to Thursday, the reason being that we're going to allow the decks to soak in and see if any headgear for Wednesday, and we'll deal with that at the end of the show. So let's move on to Thursday and start with the first race there, which is the Turner's Novices Chase, for which Mighty Potter is a short price favourite, ahead of Bambridge at 7-2. So Gerhard 4-1, appreciate it stepping up in trip 9-2, to 10-1 to bar. We start with Mighty Potter, and we start with what happened to him in last year's Supreme, and also in the preliminaries, travelling over, not so good and seemed to lose his mind a little bit beforehand. Yeah, he did. And look, that was a mistake at the fourth last hurdle, but his goose was cooked before he got to there. Uh, this is him then in the Drinmore. He'd improved on his jumping, but he over just was over jumped once or twice in the Drinmore, pecked at the back of the fourth last and again at the back of the third last fence uh, when he reached for it. But that was a much improved round of jumping than he had put in at Down Royal. And then he went to the Dublin Racing Festival. His jumping mid race, Lydia, was more like a two miler. 
than a, than a staying horse. He was so quick through the air against experience, against an experienced driver in Galliard de Menin, mm. who has a lot of jumping done. He's a high class horse, Mighty Potter, um, and he's going to take a lot of beating. One stat, and I don't know why it is, but Drinmore winners have a poor record at Did Cheltenham. They? Yeah. So Michael Shinners told me last night. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's traditionally the ground, the difference in ground that you I might I have no guess. idea, but it, I would be surprised if this fella doesn't put it right. That, to me, was the performance, because I was a non-believer up until that point, but that was very impressive. But that's probably what you like to see with a novice chaser. Down Royal, the Ferry House is better than Down Royal. Leperstown was better than Ferry House. There's every chance Cheltenham could be better than Leperstown. When we looked at the Dream All there, Banbridge was in it. He was never at the races, was he? He wasn't going from the start. The ground would no. have suited him. It was a quick reappearance. Exactly, and you'd have to worry about the ground for him tomorrow as yes. well, or Thursday even. And I haven't said that. The sun is shining, so who knows what it'll be. Willie Mullen says it's only Elan. Uh, John Poulin says it's off, so it'll be interesting to see how it, how it rides. But Banbridge is definitely a better horse on the ground on a sound surface. Definitely. Potentially some more rain to come as well, but the forecast remains unsettled. Let's have a look at Banbridge in action. We can see him over two miles here at Cheltenham. And of course, he won the Martin Pike here last season. He did, but look, he showed the pace on good ground here in November to race really handily. He didn't have the gears then to lie up in Leperstown at the DRF, but you'd have to think going up to this trip, which he was a winner at over hurdles, is going to suit Banbridge much better. Here he is, midfield in the Irish Arkle. Even in front of him, you have a Preciate and Il Fabiolo. Now, Preciate is going to reappose him, and I think going up in triple suit, Preciate, who for me was more involved in this race than Banbridge ever was. Banbridge was written to come home and try and get as much as he could, whereas Appreciated was put in the contest, was competitive and faded. So I wouldn't be surprised were Appreciated to turn the form of Banbridge. Banbridge nuts him on the line here. I won't be surprised if Appreciated finishes in front of Banbridge. Are you confident that Appreciated will get the trip? Absolutely. Why? Because I say he's crying out for it. OK. And it he's a supreme winner. Supreme winner, you think back, Constitution Hill is going to try and win a champion hurdle off winning a Supreme. Who was the last horse before him to do that? Go on, tell me. Oh, back in the 70s, one of them really good, no, it wasn't Sir Kent, could have been Sir Kent, something along those lines. Um, it's not, it's Supreme, don't ask me why, but Supremes tend to throw up stairs rather than speed horses. He's the age he is. He's a bit of a senior coming into the novice he is, chasing ranks. And that's a negative. Being yeah. a nine-year-old in the novice chase, there's no doubt about that. And it's two seasons since that Supreme. It is, and he was disappointed in last year's champion. Uh, so I think two and a half will suit him better, and I think he'll give Mighty Potter a rest. OK. Let's talk stage star, shall we? Uh, we'll start with his disappointing run in the Berkshire Novices chase at Newbury, where he kept going out to his left. Yeah, late on especially. Made a mistake at the eight fence, but uh, definitely out to his left late on. Sebastopol comes and beats him. Cam Brown never jumped the fence. Um, but, look, it's on Landon as much as anything when he was going left and off to his left under Harry Cobden. It was a below-par run, but he didn't seem to do it when he came back in here then and won a novice handicap. Uh, with top top weight, hadn't yes. he? And he didn't seem to jump left on that occasion. That's a good level of form, Lydia, but I think this is another step up. Yes, and he blew out at the festival last year, albeit he had excuses. I think it was ulcers, wasn't it? And in general, lots uh, of things. I didn't that, check. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that he came home with issues. I suppose he's got to prove that he is this graded level. He, you know, he's very dominant in handicap company, but horses can be. Frodon, for example. Yeah, I, I do think this is a step up from him. He wouldn't be on my radar now. OK. Balco Coastal. Now, Nicky Henderson has been very keen on the preview circuit about Balco Coastal's chances in the Turners. Yeah, look, and you have to listen to it. Um, but here he is at Sandown behind Jerry Kalam. Um, and he, look, he looked a quicker horse here than Jerry Kalam and ultimately gets outstayed. He jumped well, Balco Coastal. My morale has been a disappointing chaser, but you're looking at Jerry Kalam and you're tying Jerry Kalam in down to two and a half mile form in Ireland which is beating Adamantly Chosen and Kilcrud at Limerick you saw what Mighty Potter did to Adamantly Chosen at the Dublin Racing Festival and unless Balco Coastal for my money he has to improve considerably from the City Isles if he's going to win maybe he has and that's why Nicky Henderson is talking about him well, he's clearly pleasing, he must be, given given the warm words that have been uh, levelled at him. I was kind of thinking he's more of a manifesto type horse than necessarily yeah, a Cheltenham type Yeah, maybe horse. he will be, but he's coming here on Thursday, yep. that's the plan. Yep. Um, and we'll see how he gets on. Let's have a look at the, what betting one final time for the Turner's Novices Chase and see if there's anything at the larger prices that you think is relevant. I, I don't, to be honest. I think uh, 
the right horse's favourite and I think they are now, they, those declarations aren't until tomorrow morning. I still think appreciated at 9-2 to two is an each way bet to nothing. We're expecting Sir Gerhard to go to the Brown Advisory and we'll have that confirmed to you in a moment. An expected party potentially for the... I think I'm the chosen will be in the Brown Advisory. Yes, he was supplemented for it. Can't imagine I am Maximus James is Burley in there. James probably run here. Might do. Um, has to improve a lot off can his last run. Can you explain that last run at all? No. No. no, very disappointing. I, I think that field could be small, so I think appreciated there now at 92 each way before declarations. Any chance that... Quickly. <laughs> any chance that James Burley just did too much, was too exuberant on his, his, his chase debut and kind of left his run behind there? Very possible. He had been off a long time and that might have left his mark. That's how it looked anyway. OK. But you can never measure that and you can never be sure that's what it is. No, no. I'm just throwing a potential reason at you. Let's move on to the Ryanair, shall we? Uh, and again, we have a very, very warm favourite here in Shishkin at 8 to 11. Blue Lord, who runs here, rather than the Queen Mother Champion, chases fives alongside uh, Conflated, who goes for the Gold Cup, of course. Janadil is 11 to 2, 9 to 1, and upwards the rest. Now, Shishkin, we'll start with his, his, the story since this time last year, where he never went a yard in the Queen Mother Champion chase, and it turned out that he'd got a rare bone condition. Yeah, and look, he was beaten so early, Lydia, he would never go to the first fence, Nick, or the Boyneville is nudged, and we can see his hands moving there that was so uncharacteristic I suppose and this race was over already for Shishkin now and there was an ex uh, uh, legitimate excuse for it he came back in the Tinga Creek and to be honest with you in the Tinga Creek he just looked like he wanted further Definitely. Um, he was always to the pin of his collar I don't think this was a bad run I just think this was the run of a horse who had been flat out all the way uh, makes a mistake at the third last fence because he's been under the pump for so long there's not enough jumps left in the locker and, and he finished third, but I didn't think that was a bad run. I agree with you. I, I'm with you on that reasoning, and I think it was really interesting in the Ascot Chase if you compare to how he jumped in the Clarence House. And I know he won the Clarence House, but he went out quite a bit to his left at Ascot, and he was much straighter in the Ascot Chase. Was that a going a stride oh, less that's quickly? That's all it is, yeah. and it's probably only. It mightn't even be a full mile an hour, um, but it's just that little bit slower that makes the big difference to Shishkin, and I thought he was really good in the Ascot chase. The ease of which he travelled, he looked so much more comfortable, and when you look back through his form, he has some form on soft ground as well, so he's going to be really hard to beat. Let's move on to Blue Lord, shall we, who, as I said, meant, runs here rather than the Queen Mother Champion chase. Let's do the story of his season as well. He started off in the Clonmel Oil chase, ending up clinging on from a Tornado Flyer. Yeah, but it was the first run of the season, um, and... He just got a bit tired. He jumps the second last really well and a good jump at the last seal, the deal to beat Tornado Flyer, who, of course, was a King George winner. Um, but, look, I just think that he got tired on this occasion up the hill in Clonmel on his first start, but he has won a two and a half. He then went to Leperstown and put up what was a career best, by to me, anyway, uh, when Daryl rode him at Leperstown at Christmas. He beat Captain... Guinness and back in second and Shaq and Boursois on the outside but I thought this was his best performance but we didn't see the same horse at the Dublin Racing Festival Was he flattered here? Two weak finishes against him? Possibly was but I would also think a horse that finishes as strong as he did at Leperstown usually wouldn't have trouble going up in distance yeah, and you can he... say that same for Il Fabiolo but Il Fabiolo was galloping over horses in the Arkle all the way I felt and he'd have no problem at the trip whereas Blue Lord when you watched him at the Dublin Racing Festival was always going as fast as he wanted to be going behind gentlemen to me he was and at Clonmel he looked a little bit burly in the paddock as well before he was it was Clonmel Clonmel in November is a long start. way from March. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk, take a look at his stable companion, Janadil, shall we? And we'll start with his long-awaited comeback in the Red Mills. Yeah, and it was a good run. He obviously had been second here last year to, to Ala Ho. Um, better fancy stable mates here. Hotong Kalor down the outside, Capitano in the middle in the quarter cap. Um, and the star was Janadil. Good jump with the second last. And all of a sudden, Janadil takes off. And he's gone by Hotong Kalor before they get to the last, where he jumps it well for... Doesn't jump it well, actually. Neither does Hotong Kalor. But uh, he keeps going on the Rachel Blackmore. He is a runner, there's no doubt about it, but I still think he's running for the same position as last year. Second, yeah. 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 He, it, it was impressive that he managed to come from last to, to first in it, that it race. Was, it was, and it didn't run. look a quick race, so he no. probably had to do well to get there, but he has won a couple of two-mile hurdle races. Here he is last year, conflated parts, or fall, sorry, at the second last, and he chases home to Alaho. I guess, Lydia, if there is a disappointment at this year's festival, it's the fact we're not getting to see Alaho take on Shishkin. It really is. I mean, that's a massive disappointment, yeah. and it means the race will be run differently because Alaho just ran the brains out of everything else yeah, for the past two seasons. It, it does and uh, yeah, that would have been another massive clash but anyway look it's not happening so no point in talking about it. Before we join Nick let's just have a final flash of the betting. Is Shishkin the right place? I mean the way you're talking it suggests that he should be shorter. I probably do think 
yeah, I think like if you run this race anywhere other than at the Cheltenham Festival, he's shorter. But that doesn't just because at the Cheltenham Festival doesn't mean the race is any different. And who leads from that lot? Is it French Dynamite? Yeah, possibly. Uh, he'll go forward. Miller, and is there anything no. taking him on? No, probably not. But he, I wouldn't mind riding Shishkin in the Paddy Power Gold Cup off French Dynamite's mark. I take the point, but if you're playing for second, I think he might be overpriced. Anyway, let's go and join Nick. Lydia, thank you. Bree's got up to the point now where just about stop a train. We're on the old course just after the final hurdle. John Pullen Clark of the course is with me now. Fair to say the elements are challenging you, John. You're going to get a bit of everything. Blown away today, dry out tomorrow. We get wet Wednesday and Thursday. What do you think we'll be starting on if this breeze continues? Yeah, Nick, the, the, the breeze is just helping dry the top out a little bit, but what it'll also do is blow in a few showers as well, so we could get another mill or two during the day. Um, forecast suggests we might get something wintry early hours of tomorrow morning, so, uh, you know, that'll just keep the moisture in there. So I think, you know, I think we'll be soft ground to start with. Had you not watered when you had to water because we were having such a dry winter, how different would this place look and how different would the ground be? Yeah, I mean, certainly from a grass health point of view, we wouldn't be where we are. Um, you know, we needed to get on from, from that point of view uh, when we did mid-Feb as soon as we could. Um, as soon as the last sort of cold period finished, we started irrigating as much for grass health as anything. So, um, you know, we, we, we wouldn't be too far away from where we, where we are now. You know, we'd want to, to get to at least good to soft anyway. And, uh, you know, OK, we'll be starting on soft probably. But, uh, you know, we're, ha we're happy with what we've done. Is it fair to say, and I don't want to tempt fate, but the forecast has improved a shade today for the rest of the week? It has, yes. As I say, we might get a little wintry shower uh, in the early hours of tomorrow, but then tomorrow's looking mainly dry. Um, Wednesday, there's a further band of rain moving in later in the day, and that will carry on through Thursday as well. We could see sort of 5 to 10 mil throughout Wednesday afternoon and, and Thursday. It's, it's not going to be sort of Armageddon like last year's Wednesday, no, at this stage? I'm certainly hoping, hoping not, um, and, and the forecasts aren't suggesting that. So uh, hopefully we'll be at the lower end of that. And Friday itself is looking mainly dry, maybe just the occasional shower. So certainly improved on, on the last 48 hour forecasts. Uh, so with that in mind, what would you call the new course at the moment? Is the new course softer or better than the old course? New course is slightly better. Um, so official description is soft, good to soft in places. Um, that good to soft is mainly down the back straight. Home straight is pretty much soft ground. Um, and we'll just see what the next sort of 24, 48 hours brings. But, um, you know, if we get some of that rain on Wednesday into Thursday, I think we'll still be soft ground on the new. Do you believe that by Gold Cup time, though, on Friday, especially with that fresh ground, that inside line for the Gold Cup, you could almost, almost be looking at that nice, lovely, just good to soft ground? It, it's possible, certainly. You know, if we don't get too much through, through Wednesday and Thursday, then there's every possibility that, you know, good to soft may appear somewhere, certainly, in, in Friday's going. All right. Well, at least the one dilemma you're not going to have to worry about is whether you're going to water this week. Yeah, thankfully. <laughs> All right, John. Um, you're still smiling. Hope you are by the end of the week. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nick. There you go. John Pullen, the clerk of the course. A little bit of everything. Four seasons in, well, one week anyway, Lydia, I think. Vital information. Thank you, Nick, from John Pullen there. We're going to move Wouldn't on you to... you hate his job? Yeah, it's so stressful, oh, isn't it? Why did you water? I had to water. Why didn't you water? I'd hate his job. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really tough, him and the entire team. Right, let's move on to the Paddy Power Stairs Herder, shall we? And have a look at that. Uh, Blazing Cal at the top of the market. And the Charles Byrne team have already had a, a blow, haven't they, at the weekend with Shoot, Shoot First being out yeah. of attempts. And this fella hasn't had the ideal preparation either, but he's a great comeback run in the Boyne Hurdle. As you said, Lydia Tihupu at the 100 to 30. I think the rain has really strengthened his case. Definitely. Let's start, shall we, with that ball in heard will come back from Blazing Carl. Yeah, and it was a good effort. Philip Burns rides him, and again, like Michael O'Sullivan in the, on Marine National in Goodland, Philip can't use his claim. But this was a good comeback run from him. Um, St. Sam was in there as well, a couple of Gordon Elliott runners, but it was more how he travelled and how, what he did from the second last hurdle, how he quickens up and goes away from the back of the last. It's not the strength of the opposition because this is a much stronger race he's going to run in, but you had to be taken with his performance and he devoured the hill at Navin, which is a stiff finish. We know he gets the trip and he's a really good racehorse. Um, just, I suppose, the word from Charles Burns has been, hasn't been all positive about his preparation. 
mixed messages. I'd rather judge him on that. He was very fit for that, though, I suppose. Is yeah, it wasn't in Navin, but obviously he had to be. Yeah. And it's a big ask, I think, for Philip Burns, I think, this, this race. And it, it puts him un under a spotlight, doesn't it, if you were... It does. It's a big opportunity for him, too, so the way of looking at it. Um, riding one for his dad, I doubt Charles will be putting any more pressure on him and he'll be managing the pressure that's on him um, as regards expectation. And that's what pressure is. It's, it's the pressure is the pressure to perform. It's the expectation. It is. And I'd say that'll be well managed. OK. Um, Charles Burns was comparing him to Solwit and saying that Solwit was a much more adaptable horse in terms of speed and stamina, whereas Blazing Carl is an out and out stay. He was saying that on Luck and Sunday at the weekend. Let's have a look at Chihupo, shall we? Uh, and start off with the Hatton's Grace, where he took Honeysuckle's unbeaten record. Yeah, he did. And this horse has improved for a step up in Trip Lady. This was two and a half miles. And he's definitely improved, or he's not improved. His form is better on softer ground. Um, he's two runs at the back end of last year. Looks whilst he mightn't have been able to win those races at the trip, they were run over. When you go through Durasso, he's definitely a better... Just taking Tehupu to Durasso, and you can see how he's a better horse on soft ground. He beats Classical Dream here, who will re-oppose. Honeysuckle was third. He then went to Goran Park for the Galmoy. He was entitled to win, but he did get involved in this race early enough. Beacon Edge on the outside. Um, Martin Brazel's Grand National horse was inside him. Look, it, the opposition is not outstanding. That's Somerville boy back in second, and my design in third. But at least he showed us on testing ground that he gets three miles. Yes. I think the rain has been crucial to him, really. Absolutely it, crucial. It, it removes the doubt that I had in my mind. And Torres is a massive day for Davy Russell. It is. Mighty Potter, Tehupu. Obviously, he rides Galvin in the cross-country, but it's the, it's the day for Davy Russell. Were you surprised that he went for Galvin? And not, and not, that he's on Galvin and not Delta Work? Delta Work is... Uh, Maybe on the here. ground, but um, obviously Jack rode him last year, and Keith has ridden the winner of the Cross Country Race on numerous occasions yeah. for Jiggenstown and Tiger Road, so maybe that's why they went that way. And Davy has ridden Galvin in quite a number of open chases, so maybe it was just that was the simple reason. Okay. Let's take a look at Home by the Lee, shall we? He seems to be an improved performer now that they've got the key to him, and he seems to just need space in his races. Yeah, it could be as simple as that. Um, he's a dour stare. Floor and Porter's making the run in here. Ashdale Bob in the green has been running really well all year, but it's if this gets into who stays best? I think this one it does. I think there's not a race in the calendar long enough for home by the lead, to tell you the <laughs> truth. Um, but look, he was he won the Liz Mullen from an impossible position. He ran in this race last year and definitely underperformed. I think he's a better horse this year for whatever. What's the reason? I don't know. You think it's just been ridden on the outside. Maybe it's as simple as that. But when a lot of horses have cried enough in the stairs hurdle on Thursday, this fella still be gall galloping. He's not unlike Paisley Park, mm -hmm. only he can be ridden prominently. Mm -hmm and stay, which Paisley Park can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that it, he, having more space enables him to hold his position a little bit better, whereas he was right on the inside last time and had to come round them to stay on. Also, he's a bit older, isn't he? I expect yeah, he's just a bit, a bit stronger. Yeah, The termination is definitely there. And look, Joseph hasn't a massive, O'Brien hasn't a massive jump team anymore, but his strike rate throughout the winter has been pretty impressive. Florian Porter, who's won the last two editions of, of this race, we saw him there. For me, he just hasn't been the same horse this season. And I know he was beaten coming into last year's race, but he was performing at a higher level. Yeah, he probably was, but he is key to the race as regards what shape it takes. He's still the most likely front runner. I think the undulations of Cheltenham make him an easier ride on the front end. Entry didn't suit him last year when he got running past the stands and almost didn't have a climb to slow him down. Yes. Uh, I think the climbs here help him slow down, conserve energy and, and ultimately get the trip. He's done it hard, hasn't he? He's done it hard from the front two seasons ago and, and stop start just completely dominating the yeah, race last season. Yeah, he, he, I think he's the, he's the pace. He'll be trying to do the same again. OK, let's take a look at Gold Tweet's win in the Cleave. Uh, the French Raider came over. He had to be supplemented for this race, but he's earned it here. He has. He paid for himself at the supplementary. I thought he got a really, really good ride here, Lydia. Um, you know, take your time, creep around, but it's the patience down the hill that really stuck out to me and find your line from there to the line. But, look, he, it's how do you... It is the form. It's Dashiell Drasher beside him. But I thought Johnny Sharon, who like delivered his challenge after they jumped the last hurdle before he went for goal tweet. Now, that's perfect timing on the new course at Cheltenham. It was a good performance from him. And we have to take it at face value. As Paisley Park in third, Dashiell Dasher. Why isn't he shorter? I don't know why he isn't shorter. I, I, is, I don't, is it because he's a French raider and, and people are being lazy? I don't know. I suppose he's not proven at the trip. That was a relatively steadily run race, which wouldn't have suited Paisley Park. And also, because the um, long, distant, long walk hurdle was run later on Boxing Day, 
it meant less recovery time for Paisley Park from that to that. So maybe he could run a little bit better than that. Yeah, he possibly could. But Paisley Park would run a really strong gallop. If they go really hard, it'll suit Paisley Park. I don't see where that angle is in the rest, though. Let's have a look at the betting and talk about Classical Dream, who does go very well fresh, but he hasn't had a straightforward uh, sort of preparation for this. No, but Willie Mullins did win this race with Payne Hill off the back of a 12-month layoff. We went from the Alba Bartlett to the Stay of Sorrow, But was he? that a problematic season? I mean, we have I seen... I think it was. Um, I can't imagine that was just done by design. Right. Um, I think there had been a hold-up of some shape or form. Cla uh, Classical Dream did run in that... Hatton's Grace that mm -hmm. we've just watched. Mm -hmm. um, ran really well behind And Schaefer. ran a blinder, yeah. And, yeah, I still think it'll be hard for him. Um, he's in good form at home, but he's not getting any younger either. He's nine now, too. He was patiently ridden in this race last year. Might they be more positive? I'd say it'll depend on how he goes to the start and what position he gets. He's a, he's a buzzy, active individual, and it's where Paul can get him in at the start. It's not always in your own hands. Uh, where you get to jump off in Classical Dream. Now you're going to smile. I've got to ask you about a horse that's got a huge amount of ability. There's a very big price in that betting. Asterion Falange. We're running tight on time in this show. No one <laughs> tell you that. The producer is in your ear. <laughs> you give it no chance, give Asterion Falange no chance whatsoever? None. None. OK. A lot of talent. I know he goes right, but a lot of talent. Right, let's have a look at the uh, Jack de Bromhead Mare's Novices Hurdle, shall we? Lucia, 11 to 8 favourite. Astro Diamond, we saw earlier chasing home Fasal Vega and Ilete Tom around Christmas, 100 to 30. Lot of Joy, 6 to 1. Magical Zoe and some others at 9 to 1. Lucia's jumping good enough? I think it is, and she's the best mare. Uh, she's going to be really hard to beat. If I was looking at this for an angle, if we keep, look, and depending on the weather, you don't have to play until, what's this, half five or f 4.50 on Thursday. If it gets really testing, I think Halka de Tarbert at 14 to 1 is overpriced. I, She'll stay really well. I love Halka de Tarbert. I think she's a really, really talented horse. going left handed, it'll suit her better. And she hasn't got the five pound penalty, which Lucia, Ashra Diamond, Magical Zoe all have. Lots of joy at 6 to 1. Yeah, at 8 to 1 each way, I thought it was a great price. I think it's the value gone at sixes but uh, she'll stay well and the new track will suit her but the five pounds to me won't bother Lucia if she's as good as she look, looks it didn't stop Limini, it didn't stop Lorena and I'm not sure five pounds will stop Lucia what we'll all begin with Elle if that's just coincidence <laughs> What do you think uh, the jockey arrangements will be for Lot of Joy and Ashrow Diamond where I don't will know. Paul go? I don't know, like Patrick at 10 o'clock hasn't said which one he's riding in the bumper I doubt very much Paul Towner has decided 12 hours, 24 hours before he has to make his mind up which filly he's going to ride either Might he go for Lot of Joy who's the bigger prize because Patrick has ridden Ashrow Diamond before No I'd say he'll go with whichever one he thinks and handle the ground better Ok, right those are our thoughts on Thursday. We need to move on to Friday now, and we'll go straight on to the JCB Triumph Hurdle, the opening race of the final day, for which Blood Destiny is now favourite at 13 to 8. And this is the result of a lot of talk about which horse Paul Townend is going to ride. And we've got Lossie Mouth second in at 7 to 4, Gallimasso at 4 to 1. We're going to start, though, with Gallimasso versus Lossie Mouth in the DRF. Yeah, and look, obviously, the, what would appear to be the best horse didn't win the race. Gallimarso was quite keen, though. We watched Danny Mullins had to change his hands at the back of the first hurdle, which is a signal for horses to go faster, so she gets laid up. And again, at the second hurdle, he slips his reins and has to change his grip again, and that makes her keen again. Now, the third hurdle, he didn't, because she jumped it better and his hands don't move, and he eventually gets his hands down on her neck, and she looks like she's going to settle, but she starts to charge with him again early in the, in the, in the back straight. But look, this race all revolved around Lossie Mouth and the run she doesn't get at the back of the third last hurdle. Jordan Fett in front um, jumps slightly out. Someone questioned Lossie Mouth's jumping. I don't think you can grab it. She made a mistake there because Jordan Fett missed. Gallimar so closes the door. Now Lossie Mouth's in no man's land. Sean O'Keefe drops his rein. Gusta Wind drifts out. Lossie Mouth descend into the, the Lewis station there beside Leperstown Racecourse. <laughs> and Takao runs into Fred Winter. He's upside in front. Gallimar so got first run and won the race. I think Lossie Mouth will turn that form around. You're, you're that certain? I am, yeah. That's, that's interesting because I mean, there's no doubt that she was unlucky. I mean, no, nobody is going to to argue that. But I just wonder if Danny is able to settle Gallimarso a little bit more in this field, whether she might be. I know it's a, it's a stiff test here. Yeah, it is, and I'm not sure it's going to be a massive field either. And I wasn't certain looking at them where exactly the real strong pace was going to come from to make that the case. So um, I think that could be mightn't be just straightforward now. Okay, what do you make of the yak? 
about which horse uh, Paul Tannend might ride, whether it's... Well, I can reveal that he hasn't made his mind up yet. <laughs> I knew he was going to say that. Let's have a look at Blood Destiny and ha examine the evidence, that, well, the kind of thing that Paul Tannen will be thinking about. Yeah, ground is going to play its part too. And look, he was just a sister maid in Hurling Cork uh, back in November time and he absolutely bolted up. But you'd be hoping he was going to do that. Now, the horse in third has Frank the form. That is Sir Alan in the yellow with the purple, or finished second ultimately. He's definitely Frank the form, Sir Alan. So good performance from Blood Destiny first time up. And he was good again on his second start. I, The way I look at it, Lydia, is Paul is going to have to make his mind up at 10 o'clock on Wednesday or 12 o'clock on Wednesday mm -hmm. before any of us know what rain does fall or doesn't fall. I'd imagine if he, got, if he was thinking it's going to happen, it gets really testing, he'd probably be leaning towards Blood Destiny. If it's going to start drying, he's probably leaning towards Lossie Mouth. But he has to make that decision before we know what happens. Whereas us watching it and maybe having a bet or trying to pick the winner, can wait until 1.29 on Monday, or mm. Friday, I mean, mm. to make up our minds. And I think the ground will be a big factor. The slower it is, the more I'd fancy Blood Destiny. The drier it is, the more I'd fancy Lossie Mouth. And that's the way I'd be looking at it. He the other two, Lossy Mouth and Gallimarceau, have that gold dust seven pound allowance for very good mares. That is a huge advantage. It is a huge advantage, um, but yeah, that is a huge advantage. Yeah, there's no but about it. Yeah, let's have a look at the betting one more time. See if there's anything else that we can pick out. Comfort Zone, um, who uh, picked up a, a problem just before Declaration Point. Unfortunately, he uh, was not in the six days. Script writers there, really poor performance at, at Kempton. Is there anything that you can no, say no, to excuse that? I don't know. I think Comfort Zone, Lydia, was behind last year out anyway. Mm. And Comfort Zone beat Script Writer here. So, um, no. Uh, so look, Milton Harris has a good record with them. He's a big price. Zenta. Got to improve jumping? Got to enjoy, yeah, I think she can, though. Uh, first run in Ireland, and uh, I thought she jumped well in France. So, yeah, she, she'll run, she can improve, but even on her, visually on her performance, I think she has to improve from what she did at Ferry House. And Jip Cott is the ex French supplemented horse who uh, adds a bit of spice to the field. Right, OK, let's move on to the Albert Bartlett, shall we? That is the next race that we'll have a look at, which is the three-mile hurdle for novices, for which Corpus Cross is now jointly favourite uh, with Paddy Power for, with three-card brag. But we'll start with your anti-post bet. What did you put him up at earlier? 25s, was it, for the It was for this big race? anyway, yeah. It wasn't yeah. quite as big as the 66 as the normal eights, <laughs> but it was stop big. Stop posting, stop posting. How's your portfolio looking? Yeah, it's it's not, not as good as yours, but it's not looking bad, actually. Really? It's, it's, it's all right. Six to one in Pari Pass, I don't mind that. Yeah, that'd be good. OK, right, let's let's talk about Corpus Cross, How did I miss that and you got it? I don't know. He must have been asleep that week. I think I was. Uh, Corbett's Cross. Look, he is 72, and the question mark is, will he actually run or not? And we won't find out until Wednesday. But look, here he is in A's. Found a 50, rocked on in front. And he had the pace to be able to travel comfortably in this race at just under two miles. He's a solid jumper. Uh, I honestly think he is head and shoulders the best horse in the race. I think this is a potential Gold Cup horse, Lydia. Really? To me, to have the stamina to win at three and then the pace to drop back to win at two, um, I think this is a hell of a good race horse. You've raised the possibility, and obviously we're just guessing at this point, that he might not run. Why are you thinking that? Just at the 19-day turnaround, I'd say they'll want to be absolutely delighted with him before they'll, they'll, they'll send him to, into battle, I suppose. Um, he also has the option of waiting for the Sefton, or he could wait for the Sefton, so who knows what, what way they'll go. But look, I, I'm sure as long as he's showing the right signs, uh, I'd be hoping he runs. Here he is under Maxine O'Sullivan winning over three miles at Ferry House in the handicap hurdle. I know off the mark he was on, he was entitled to win, and... He was choked in, but you'd love the way he hits the line here. I don't think stamina is an issue. Pace isn't an issue. He settles, he jumps. I think this is a very good racer. This is a classy edition, I think, of the Albert Bartlett, don't you? I think year on year, the Albert Bartlett has become a more classy race. Mm. It's, I think it's deep and, you know, and wide. I think, I think there's lots of horses here that you'll be wanting to watch how they run here and run for the rest of the season and be thinking about them as novice chasers potentially for next season. Let's talk about Embassy Garden, shall we, for Willie Mullins, who uh, won in really nice fashion at Thurles last time. He did, but the opposition didn't turn up and it became Kilbury Warrior was making the running, but the couple of Gardens horses ran particularly poor on this occasion and this race just fell apart. Now, Embassy, that's not Embassy Garden's fault, but um, he was... He routed them and won so far. It wasn't. It was amazing actually to watch how far he won. But <coughs> excuse me. Um, he jumped better going up in trip than he had done when he was down in distance. He had a good run in a maiden hurdle at Leperstown at Christmas behind Goodland and Tagman, and this is a really pleasing performance. But I think this is a much better race on Friday. 
Yeah, it's, it, it is very deep indeed. And the next source we're going to look at is Hidden Valley Lake. This is my tip for the uh, race. Uh, I was really impressed with him earlier in the season, this couple of wins. And then he was defeated by his stable companion, Monty Starr, who also runs at Clonmel. Yeah, and look, Hidden Valley Lake made the run in. It wasn't a particularly strongly run race. Monty Starr sat outside and searched for glory behind him on the inside. But I think a stronger race will bring about more improvement in Hidden Valley, Hidden Valley Lake than it might do in Monty Starr. Um, and that was a bit of a mistake at the third last. but. I just think you think here Monty Starr is going to beat him be, and beat him well. But to be fair to Hidden Valley Lake, he rallies and keeps Monty Starr honest all the way to the line. So I think on a stronger pace yeah. and a more galloping track, I think it's going to suit Hidden Valley Lake more than Monty's passing. Um, he definitely run a good race. Yeah, so do I. I. I agree with all of those points. He was having to concede weight to his stable companion, Monty Starr. I think going right-handed also suited Monty Starr. Now, in several... Um, previews. I've heard uh, Jamie Codd and some of uh, Gordon Elliott's yard mentioning Search for Glory, who isn't even on that graphic there, and saying actually that he could run pretty well. He could, and so could Favori de Champ do, and I've heard some chat for Sendor Cleegan as well, so as you said, it's a deep race. Willie also has Sham Valley Kid. Dawn Rising will love to step up and trip. Seabank Bristro was fourth in last year's bumper, mm. and I thought Stay Away Faye was unlucky at Doncaster after being impressive at Newbury. Yeah, just, uh, he was leaned on, wasn't he? He, he was, was trying to get some the room. The meat in the sandwich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the gap was closing quicker than the Chester Away FA could get through it. Yeah, he was raw as well, wasn't yeah. he? I suspect he'll take a good good step forward. Three card brag as well. Now, he has been warm all week. He has, and he's entitled to be. I thought off 142, he was the ideal runner for the Martin Pipe, but he's in here. Adrian Heskin will ride him, and yeah, he's a huge runner. Love a bit of testing ground, and I think the step right to three miles would really suit him. Yeah. Two seven in Fairy House, I think, but three miles. It looks tailor made for him. I'm finding it hard to dismiss horses in that race. I think it's going to be an absolute corker. Let's move on to the race of the entire week, which is the Buddha's Cheltenham Gold Cup, and have a look at the betting for that. Gallop in Deschamps is six to four favourite ahead of the King George winner, really impressive Brave Man's Game at six to one, and the title holder Aplutar at fifteen to two. Let's start with Gallop in Deschamps. I'm look away now. I'm going to look away now because this is what happened last year. At least he got up. It's awful. If that happens, um, then this is this year. Um, lifetime ambition. This is the John Durkin. I think we saw a much more professional gallop in the champ. He wasn't as exuberant. You saw him there getting in tight to the last fence with a circuit to go. And he was just has been this season so much more professional. Yeah. This is the last in the John Durkin. Again, Paul sits quiet, gets in and pops it. Whereas last year, he was just attacking fences and letting fly. Uh, he's much more like the horse we expected him to be last year, this year. I think he caught us all in the hop being so exuberant last year. He, I, we, we have no doubt about his stamina. We always thought he was a stare. He then went and won the Paddy Power Irish Gold Cup where he beat Fury Road, who runs across from going to the last fence. And you know, he hits the line really well and galloped out through the line. For me, that last fence is a microcosm of the improvement in his jumping. I think that that would have forced a mistake from him this time last year. That yeah, time look, last and year. look, someone was looking for a mistake there and they couldn't find it, but he was, he was good. And... He hits the line hard, gallops out through it, Statler's chasing him, but he's lucky to finish second for my money. Fury Road probably should have been second, but um, I just I love this horse, Lydia. I think it's a brilliant race, though. I think you have class and you have stairs. You have Gallop and Deschamps, Brave Man's Game, and La Plutar, and then you have Statler, a high senior, Noble Yates, Protector I'd probably fall somewhere in the middle. I think it's a belt and rest. I, I, t I totally agree with you. Some people are still questioning Gallopin de Champs jumping in the early stages about whether he still might be a little bit novicey, maybe a little bit bum high, a little bit so that something might happen in the early stages. What's your sure, take? Anything can happen any day, and the best of jumpers can fall. But uh, I, w I know if I was going out to ride him, his jumping would not be concerning me. Yeah, I, I just love the way that he seems to have retained his brilliance whilst having calmed down. Which you know something like might bite that didn't happen when no, they, when he calmed down he, he was less brilliant exactly but I think it was it was the, we, no one expected Gallopin to be as exuberant as he was last year because as a novice hurdler he was like the horse he is now as an open chaser we just saw Statler is he going to be, does he have place chances on the basis of that maybe he probably like he won on the opening day of last year's festival which was much drier ground I'm not sure how much rain he'd want okay.
Let's take a look at Brave Man's game. For me, in terms of actual form, he has the strongest form this season, this win in the King George, in which Royal Pagai inherits second. Yeah, and the other thing you have to think about here is, like, if Paul Nichols can win this Gold Cup, he'll join Ton Draper as the winning most Gold Cup trainer. He knows what it takes to win a Gold Cup. He's been very... I wouldn't say bullish, but he's been really positive about this horse in, in the late, last couple of weeks. And to me, this was the day he showed me he could be a Gold Cup horse because he's not going any better than Lampresse off the bend, but he outstays Lampresse. And uh, Frodon fades away, Roy Pagai gets dropped. I thought this was a really good performance. And he is a brilliant jumper. Mm. That is the biggest ace in his pack. Harry Cobden's having a wonderful season. And this guy is a huge runner for a team that know how to win Gold Cups. I really like this horse. Now, we point to his defeat by Bob Ollinger and more importantly, how he ran in the Ballymore uh, two seasons ago. I'm more interested in his rhythm on flat tracks. I do wonder whether it might be interrupted here at Cheltenham. I know one run at Cheltenham is not enough of a sample size. I, I'd be the other way. I think he'll have no problem dealing with the undulations, two fences, uh, drops off the back of them, some fences are on the right. I think the way he jumps, if anything, his jumping will be a bigger asset on an undulating track than on a flat track. And no, I'd have no fears about the track for him. Uh, whether he really gets three and a quarter, like Gallop in the Champ, until you watch him do it. You don't know, but I think they both will. If he handles the track, he's a massive, massive, massive threat to Galapin And the track Deschamps. doesn't worry me. OK, right, he's a massive threat to Galapin Deschamps, I think. Uh, right, let's have a look at last year's race, shall we? Aplutar won it, of course. Manila Indo was second. Protectorat was in the ruck, as was Royal Pagai. Yeah, and look, wasn't this was a steadily run race, Lydia, but do you see more pace in this year's race? Not really. Neither do I. So I think that's, that's going to be a concern, but more of a concern for a Plutar is just how badly he's run this season. We'll have a look, look at that at the moment. Now, Dan Skelton's saying that Protectorat is much fitter than we saw her from him last time in the Cotswold Chase. Well, he'd want to be. Um, but look, this is a rate at the Gold Cup, and you think about it, so many horses in contention heading to the third last. Asterian Falange, Royal Pagai, McNeil Indo, Album Foda, Protectorat, Galvin, a Plutar, um, even Santini wasn't that far behind him. This was a race from the top of the hill home, and the fastest horses absolutely routed them. I didn't. I thought walking out of here last year after watching this Gold Cup, if he comes back like that, he could win another one and maybe two more. Uh, this was a brilliant, brilliant performance, but there is a question mark over him since Haydock, and we haven't seen him since then. Now, Album Photo won a Gold Cup, or two Gold Cups, off just one run in a season, but at least they were winning runs. This fella's trying to win it off one disappointing run. Yeah, and Album Photo, it was the plan, what, what he yeah. was doing. Oh, I know, and this fella had a knock on his joint at Christmas and didn't get to run in Leperstown, but um, Henry's been making positive noises about him too. I think we've looked at the three classy ones. And then you're wondering what kind of a Gold Cup is it going to be? Because to me, there's a pile of stairs in there as well. Let's remind everybody of just how bad Haydock was, because this was abject, really, particularly compared to how he won it the previous season. Ah, it was. Bristol de Mays in front, El Dorado Allen. Uh, not El Dorado Allen. Um, fraud on. Bristol de May? Bristol de, Bristol de May in front, and obviously Protector at, but he was just beaten so far from home. It's hard to... You have to put a line through it, because that's not his form. That's not his ability. So you just put a line through that and hope that they've figured out why. Yeah, it's just, it's hard to to be confident about that. There is Protector had a really good run. The thing is, it's so long ago that whatever was at him or was bothering him, surely gone by now. It wasn't last week or three weeks ago. That's last November. I mean, it, the level of form that he showed last season, he's obviously, I mean, he is class, as, you, as you've just said, is conflated class. Let's have a look at him, shall we? He's been laid out for this, essentially. He missed the Irish Gold Cup after he won this, the Savills Chase. Yeah, and Jack Kennedy elected to go on with him and he faced into the back straight in the Savills and he jumped them into the ground. Uh, Gordon Elliott keeps telling us he's grown up, he's a much stronger, he's more of a man of a horse now. And... He's very, very good. I personally think he has to improve a little bit. I'm not sure French Dynamite stayed. I think Kenboy is definitely regressing. And behind him, you have um, Franco de Porte. And Galvin ran bad on that occasion. But I think I think he has to step forward on that. Now, he could have. This was a relatively steadily run. So was the Irish Gold Cup that he won last season. For me, he's got to prove his stamina, and I'm not convinced. Yeah, but it, it, he definitely didn't have the speed for the Ryanair. No, no. So um, no. I think he's definitely in the right race. But... He could be betwixt and between, though, could could, he? could be. A bit like Protectorat. Is he at that level? Is he going to get up to the next level? Mm -hmm. We won't know till Friday. 
protect track features in the next clip that we are going to show you. This is the Cotswold Chase, won by a Hoist Senor. Noble Yates is in there too, without cheek pieces. Yeah, he has them back on, obviously, or will have them back on on Friday afternoon. And yeah, look, he was the one for me to take out of it. Hoist Senor is the probably pace angle maybe in the Gold Cup, but depends on how he jumps early as to how fast he's going to go, Hoist Senor. Uh, sounds Russian took it off from very early on. I doubt he'll do the same again on Friday. But uh, Noble Yates wasn't knocked about here. It was a prep run for the Gold Cup. He's come home really strongly. Cheap pieces will help him. But I just wonder, has he the, has he the class to lie into a brave man's game or a gallop in the champ when they open off the bend? Will they just get too far away from him? I think they might. I think he's a thorough stay. He's the kind of horse that could be staying on for third or uh, second, maybe. Yeah. maybe. And look, that'll do me, Lydia. 66 to 1. Uh, yep. A fifth of that will do fine. Sounds Russian is, an, is a steadily improving horse. He'll run a solid race. I can't see he him. He will, and I wouldn't be surprised if they use a marginal change of tactics on him. He definitely got competitive he under did. instruction to, but yep. definitely got competitive a bit soon in the Cotswold chase. A fitter protector at? Dan yeah. Skelton was basically saying he's slightly ashamed about how far <laughs> off what he needed to be there yeah, to win the Cotswold look, it's, chase. It's, training is an art, it's not a science. So it's, it's, you know, you get things wrong, but I still think he has to be better than the horse that won the Haydock. And a horse in your, uh, I think that this track, the new course and the Gold Cup trip will really suit him, one of the few tests that will suit him. His jumping has got to be good, he's got to get into a rhythm in the early stages. In the early part of the Gold Cup, do you think he can do that? I think he can. I'd be more worried about the middle part of the Gold Cup. If he faces into the back on the, in the, on the second circuit, if he misses the first one and is a bit awkward at the water, you could find yourself going from first to ninth. Mm. And, would not, and be stuck with nowhere to go. I think he's jumping the middle part of the second lap will be more important. Yeah, I think I'm going to have my heart in my mouth about hoisting you at several points during the course not of this where race. Derek Fox's heart will be. <laughs> he'll, he'll be fine. He'll be, he'll be much more able to deal with it than me. Let's have a look at the betting. Uh, Minella Indo, we should talk about him because he's got a great record at Cheltenham. He beat Statler, albeit he had tracks position and was receiving weight at Tremor. Yeah, he's former Gold Cup winner and who knows, like, when you collapse in the Pride Ring if he wins. I most certainly won't fall out of the ITV truck if he does win, but um, I still don't see it. OK, Gallop into Sean for you. I'm not going to turn me back on him now, you? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's really shining from you, actually, how, how much you believe in, in Gallop into Sean. Let's talk about the Mayor's Chase, the Mrs Paddy Power Mayor's Chase, shall we? Another short price favourite, Allegory de Vassi. Huge ability, jumps right. Now, what kind of jumping right are we talking about here? Well, she is not the right you want. <laughs> She's the wrong right. Um, but look, it's going to be a challenge for Paul Town and it'll be his last right of the meeting and it'll be a real test for him. But it's the kind of challenge I used to look forward to. He's going to have to get her inside a couple and try and get her straight. How long is he going to have, I mean, bearing in mind her ability, which I don't doubt, how long is he going to have horses around him to keep him on the inside, if you know what I mean? That's the challenge. Mm. That's what he has to you do. You would relish that, would you? Yeah. Yeah. Does she win? She's very good, uh, but so is Impervious. I thought Impervious got a really good ride to beat Journey With Me at uh, Punchestown. Journey With Me won yesterday in this, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and he won really well, so it's strong form. Jeremy's flame is solid. She is solid. Um, she is solid, but will have to improve. She'll be ridden the right way for the rest. And the title holder, Ellie May, hasn't had a great season. No, and she's got a bit older and um, probably wouldn't want... She, I don't think she'll want the OK. Right, that's Friday coming to a close. The last bit of the show will be about Wednesday, now that we have the declarations. But first, let's join Nick in the stables. I'm down here at the stable yard with Patrick Mullins. We spoke to David Casey, we spoke to Willie, so we're completing the hat-trick now, Patrick. And you did decide in the end to, to ride fact or file in the bumper. Yeah, uh, look, for me, it was probably a toss-up between himself and it's for me. There's nothing between them at home, and they both travel over well. They both handle the ground. Um, I suppose Factor Fire has a little bit more experience, and I think Willie was keen for me to ride him. So, as much as I enjoy disagreeing with Willie, I'll, it suits me to go with him this time. It's, I mean, it's a huge production. We've just seen about half the string out this morning. It's, it's, it's become a proper monster, this, hasn't it? It has. Um, but look, we're, we're used to it now at this stage. We have a great, uh, like Rachel Robbins is there running the show. My mother does all the logistics, and um, we sort of know where everything's meant to be at the right time, at the right place. So. Uh, it works. Organised confusion, but it works. So you just need to get on and ride the horses. I mean, that's a nice, nice start for you. First up with Diverge in the in the Supreme Novices. I have a great book of rides for the week. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, Diverge, obviously by Frankel. Uh, look, he needs to settle. He was too keen at Christmas, and then obviously the last time in 
in a very less competitive race, he, he settled fine, but he'll need to settle, and I could definitely see him run on to third or fourth. There's plenty there that will fancy their chances, and I imagine we'll just be sneaking around and hoping something falls into our lap. All right, just looking at the, the rest of the day, we haven't given State Man much, much air time on this show already. Perhaps we ought to give him a, a, a little bit more. How's he travelled over? How's he doing? Look, he's travelled over fine. He travelled over here last year. Um, Sinead, who rides Mother of Day to Light him, he's rode out this morning. Um, so look, in a normal year, you'd be really, really fancying him, but it's, it's an extraordinary year, I think. There was a hole by Hardor's name in the Arkle for a long time, and I wondered whether you were going to fill it, but Sean O'Keefe's manfully, manfully standing in for that job. Yeah, no, look, we're, I suppose we're, we have plenty of jockeys there, and we're tr trying to get everyone involved, and um, so Sean has had a bit of luck with some of Rich's horses, so, and here in Chetland with us, so um, he, 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 can, he can have Hardor. Now, El Fabiolo, I've not seen properly close up in the flesh before. He is an absolute brute of a horse. He is. He, he's a brute. He's a monster. Um, he's, you know, he's Yuna, who's about five foot five, used to drive out home last Last year and about this year Christmas she came up to me and says I can't hold him anymore which there was only about three people in the yard who can hold him um, he was given Paul an offline this morning but uh, look I thought his run at the DRF that was a race with huge depth ran at a proper gallop that's the best performance I've seen this year yeah Dice Dynamo is going to crack on and get on with it and you know he's going to be a tough nut to, to crack he'll be he'll be hard to pass won't he here. he will and this track will suit him better more jumping tighter track um, you know, it's it's far more uh, suitable to a front runner than Leperstown, so he will um, definitely be, you know, it'd be hard to reel in. But I think his style of running suits Al Fabiolo as well. So um, look, John Bond is obviously a very talented horse, as well. But what I saw at Aintree last year, I think our horse has more ability. Um, how hard did you have to work to get him to run Gaia de Manila in the in the National Hunt Chase? Uh, I think I just I just bit reverse psychology and um, I also just bit of subconscious. I, I kept writing him out in schooling and stuff. So uh, look, it's great. He he's, he ticks all the boxes. He he stays. He settles. He has the experience, which is huge in this race. Um, it's a, I know he's not a prolific winner, but it is a drop in in, in grade. He's normally running grade ones or top weights in the Irish National. Um, He's my best chance of the week, and you know he's the one I'm most looking forward to riding. Is there anything that you've got on this week that you're surprised that you're riding? Um, uh, As you say, it's a, it's a hell of a book. It is, yeah. Uh, no, at the moment, like I, I, there's I, Friday is going to be interesting. There's one or two I'm trying to get get on Friday. I'm not sure if he'll let me on him, but um, I, I, I have to I'll have to play uh, play my cards right through the week. Okay, well, might you get on a might you get one of the Triumph Hurdle horses? Uh, that's, that's what I'm that's gonna, what you're angling that's what I'm for, angling for but uh, we'll, we'll see how, how Willie's feeling. Yeah. How do you think? How do you see it? Who are your one, two, three in that in that race? Look, Blood Destiny is a very, very good horse. Um, the, the race in Fairy House was a funny race. I think the rest of them were probably thinking of the Fred Winter and we were thinking of the Triumph. Um, and it's not not just a case of being better than Lies Mouth and Gallimar So He needs to be eight pounds better than him because he has to give them seven. Um, Gallimar So is obviously a talented mare, but She's quite keen, and this new co that new course is hard on keen horses. That's a worry for her. Lozzy Mout ticks all the boxes. Um, she settles, she stays, she has the class, she has the experience. She's the one to beat. You could get on any of them at this stage. Well, I don't think I, I don't think I do the mare. I, I wouldn't do the, the weights on the mare. So it's blood destiny, maybe. If if uh, yeah, but we'll see, we'll see. Uh, and and Stadler in the Gold Cup. I mean, how is how is he trading into the race? Yeah, uh, look, I schooled him there the other day and rode him work, and we're happy with him. Um, Look, I suppose the bit of, bit of rain is no harm for him, but he won here last year on very good ground. Uh, but the rain will slow all the others down. Um, look, he's that type of horse. He's a, native, he's a native river type of horse. They can win Gold Cups, um, but Gallopin is going particularly well. So, um, you know, he could be up against it, but you never know. All right, have a good week. Come back safe. Okay, thanks Cheers. so much. It's been the Mullen show, hasn't it? But it's been really interesting for They're that the only reason. ones here. Everyone yeah. else had all their work done and was gone home for the day. <laughs> the, packed up, The rest finished. of Willie's on Willie time, which is <laughs> absolutely no rush. Well, it suited us. Everyone else is organised. It suited us. I'm glad to see it. Right, we've got the decks for Wednesday, so let's have a look at that. We'll start with the Ballymore Novices Hurdle, shall we? And there they are. On Power Pass is there as expected. And... Champ Kylie is there as well, and Gaelic Warrior has gone here rather than the Supreme. We knew that from the Supreme declarations. I don't know whether we have the betting just yet, or whether we can go straight. Let's let's go straight to Ampere Pass, shall we? And what he has done so far this season. Yeah, he's been good. He won a two-three maiden hurdle, loads of jumps bypassed. Um, yeah, and I would look, what did he beat? Probably not superstars, but that wasn't his fault. Fear for fear of frost was second, but he then went from there, dropped down in trip, went to the Moscow Flyer of Punchestown. And look, Punchestown's not a tight track. Um, and this was an out, a really 
you're not thinking, wow, that's grade one novice form. And the Model Kingdom was second, ultimately finished the second, and she could be anything, went along in front. But it was the manner in which he did it, and I think the manner, Lydia, in which he has improved since at home that has everybody talking about it. Yeah, and everybody is. That, that, that seems to be the horse that Classon have been pushing forward in, in recent days. I love his jumping. Yes, and his mentality, um, yes. his attitude. He's a really relaxed horse at home. Amy Morrissey rides him every morning. He showed a good turn of foot, which we weren't sure he had at Punchestown. And knowing that he has the stamina, I believe you need a turn of foot to win a Ballymore. So do I, which is why I liked him for this race. Yeah. I think it could be a end-to-end -end gallop Ballymore for two reasons. One of them, Hermes Allen, the other one, Champ Kylie. That is different to some Ballymores, which can put more emphasis on speed. Yeah, I'd say Paul Nicholas probably still isn't over me getting beaten on Denman um, for not going fast enough. So I'd say he'd have <laughs> Harry Cobden rocking along on Hermes Allen, um, who made all to win a Chalo. Um, obviously, Champ Kylie can be a bit keen, but if Hermes Allen is going to strong gallop, I, I don't think Danny Mullins will take Harry Cobden on. No. Let's have a look at Hermes Allen, shall we? And the win in the Chalo. Uh, this was a, a really good performance. It was. And it was, look, a lot of horses behind him have gone in one race since. Why don't Chalo winners win Ballymores? Are they stairs? Well, generally, that, that would be the theory, I think. Now, the thing I would point out about the Chalo is it was much deeper race this season than it had been recently because they got rid of a listed race that clashed with it at Cheltenham and it meant for a deeper field, deep, bigger, deeper field. Yeah, and it, look, it, he was really impressive. And what more can Hermes Allen do when he win the race? You wear it well, went and won well at Sandown since in a strong enough mare's hurdle and he's absolutely brushed her aside, given her weight. He's a very good horse um, and he, I think, has surprised a lot of people in Ditchie that didn't, don't think they thought they knew they had him when he went to Stratford. And that's often a good thing. Yes. Horses that are not burning up the gallop but are bringing it to the race course they're often really good horses and then he came here to Cheltenham so he's got yeah, some yeah and danced around here in front he jumped really well on that occasion and look he's a very good horse he represents strong English form Next up is Gaelic Warrior, who had been shortening for the Supreme earlier on this week, but they are going for the Ballymore, despite the rain having fallen. The, the concern is him jumping right. Yes. Um, this is the Fred Winter last Fred season. Fred Winter, when he was upsides in front, or in front most of the way, and the further he was going, the more right he was going there, the second last across in front of Brazil, and he went very last, at, very right at the last hurdle, which ultimately cost him the race. Here he was at Leprosound in a handicap hurdle, off a pretty high mark on this occasion. He was off 143 with top weight, and and the further he went in the race, the more right he went. That's early in the race. Down the inside bit of cover, he was straight enough. It was only later in the race at uh, Leperstown when he got out on his own that he went right. When he had horses outside him and he had cover, he went straight. So is this a sort of Ale allegory de Vassi challenge for you? Yeah, it's Keeping him buried on the inside? It's Patrick Mullins is facing it, not Paul Townend. But yeah, and that is a challenge of riding horses. Um, you know, different horses have different... Weakness is the wrong word. Uh, have diff have weaknesses. I said it is a weakness, I suppose, for this particular target. Yeah. I mean, it's not a weakness necessarily. Necessarily, and as as riders, you have to figure those out and try and overcome them. Another one for you. This is Champ Kylie. We were discussing earlier on in the season. He jumps right too. Yeah, he does. Uh, I'm not sure he goes maybe as as right as as Gaelic Warrior. Definitely not as right as Allegory de Vassi. Uh, he made all in the Lawlers. He was too key, too keen in the Royal Bond. He saw him at the first day with Danny, jumped out to his right. He'll be up there with Hermes Allen. Be interesting to see which side of Harry Cobden Danny can get. Uh, will he get inside him or, or will Harry get on the inside? Danny will have to go outside him. But look, this horse is has improved. He's won blip on his form, lady, and that was the run in the Royal Bond where That's he ran explicable, where though. he ran away with Paul. Yeah. Um, yes, I thought it was despicable, explicable. Yeah. Can explain it. Yeah. Can use smaller words, English words. <laughs> um, but look, he's other than that. But Irish Point, how strong is that form? Yeah, people have knocked it for that. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I still think that was a pretty good performance. I mean, he he went out hard in front, didn't he? And it's going to be he's going to want this to be a, a well-run race. And as you say, the Royal Bond, he just did too much far too soon. Yeah, um, yeah, he's a runner and he's he's a good price. I know Danny fancies him. Let's take a look at Good Land, shall we? That when the that Nathaniel Lacey at the Dublin Racing Festival over two miles six, so dropping back in trip. I think it'll suit him. If anything, he was a little bit keen early on the card. I think the ground will suit Good Land. I'd be worried for Barry Connell and Mikey O'Sullivan with Marine National and testing ground, but I think this horse will handle it. And look, Sendor Cleegan chased him home here. He's well fancied in the Albert Bartlett. 
and this is a solid enough performance and I think dropping down a triple suit him he stays really well absolute notions doesn't run outside that you had Henry's horse in the purple colours the deep cave okay. it's a fairly good a very good horse as well and you had guy the Jigginstown one running on cool survivor who has a chance in the Martin Pipe but um, I think Goodland coming down a trip is a big player I think given that we're anticipating it being a strongly run Ballymore I suits think him. he's a player. Yeah, yeah. suits him. Yeah. Whereas in, in the other scenario of Ballymore, I'd have yeah, been worried about it. Yeah, it can do. And I, I often wonder why do Ballymores end up being run slower than Supremes? I think often people go home after Tuesday and reassess <laughs> how they've ridden and what's happened and often can get cautious by the first race on Wednesday, thinking I probably went too fast on that one and we went too hard on that one. We're going up in trip and you end up going too slow on a valley more. I think that that's happened to me anyway, okay. on more than one occasion. So it's born of a head in hands moment on Tuesday yeah. evening. Right, okay, I'm picturing that. Right, let's have a look at the brown advisory, shall we? Again, we've got the declarations for you, and that's, this should be quite interesting, I would think. Yes, the real whacker is there. They were still right up until the wire, entertaining that entry in the Gold Cup. Adamantly chosen, of course, had been supplemented for it. The favourite, Jerry Colom, is there, and Ramillies is here, um, which, again, we knew from the National Hunt Chase declarations for the Tuesday, but good to see him confirmed there. Time Hill also there. Um, and Gallia de Lito, who, as a result of the rain, she is present in the Brown Advisory. Right. I rest, Lydia, I thought, looking at early in the week, code cut up seven runners maybe eight max has 11 which is great to see um, and plenty of strong stairs in here and there'll be a bit of value in this race obviously the favourite is Jerry Kalam and he's rock solid yes let's start with him shall we uh, have a look at him at Sandown winning the Silly Isles over Shorter yeah look we watched this looking at Balco Coastal a while ago and Balco Coastal outpaces him at one point but he's a solid enough jumper for Jordan Gainford ping the first railway and the second and then danced in front of the third one when Jordan gives him a kick here and uh, Jerry says ah uh, I know better than that. Uh, great sign for a brilliant out of any horse, but spectacular out of an obvious to do that. And he really starts to rally and wins. I don't think this horse has been impressive, overly impressive, as in won by a big distance in any of his starts. I think he only just does enough. He loved the soft ground. He loved the step up and trip. And he's without doubt the correct favourite. I, I agree. I think the, the doubt for me, in my mind, definitely not the step up and trip, definitely think he wants that, but was the ground. So the rain has removed that. However, the doubts about Sir Gerhard for me are not removed. He's just too inexperienced for this race and he didn't jump well enough on his sole chase start. I thought he made one mistake and other than that he jumped fine. Um, I thought he was good later on in the race. Obviously this is the third, second fence he jumped, fraction to his right maybe, but then he banks the last for the circle to go. I think it's this one. I'm hoping it's this one. Yep, it is that one. Um, and that was his mistake. I think he learned from it. But I was impressed in the video when he ran around the bend to the next fence. He didn't back off it and take him five minutes to jump it. He went and popped it as he should do. So the mistake didn't frighten him. Thought he was good down over the last three fences. The unknown is the trip. Yes. Will he stay? I think he can do. Uh, people would say he was tying up maybe in last year's Ballymore. I think he raced a bit freely. I wouldn't be surprised if Paul rode him more conservatively with a bit of cover. And at the end of the day, it's an 11 runner, three mile novice chase. That's what he's running. You do need to stay, though. He will need to stay, and we don't know if he does or not. I'm against him. I'm a little bit worried about Time Hill as well. Let's have a look at the state of his jumping at Newbury first uh, I think it was the ditches. Mm -hmm. I think it was only the ditches, and I think they ironed it out by the time he got to Kempton. But it, to me, it was the ditches. He'd swear it looked like there was a bonfire inside in the ditch there, the height he went over that one. <laughs> and again, at the next fence, jams on and way up in the air. I think this is a massive opportunity for Michal Nolan, and I hope it goes well for him. Uh, a lovely guy who's worked really, really hard, but I thought he was much better at the ditches at Kempton. Wasn't a bother on him there, whereas Gallio Leto, her jumping fell apart at Kempton, but she went to Warwick then and was brilliant. But it was a weird day. It happened in the King George as well. I mean, maybe you could uh, you could pick holes in that way, but it ha definitely happened in the Corto Star. There were shadows. There were lots of horses taking off far, far too early. There were mistakes where you don't usually see mistakes it's at Kempton. To see, that's because they don't jump them with the shadows enough anymore and they were out of practice. <laughs> But I think, I mean, it's a glacial time. She didn't disagree, though. <laughs> it's a glacial time for the Corto star. And I think he's the one that made the fewest mistakes. Fair the enough. fabulous to run up finish but lame. I, yeah, I think his jumping, though, was ditch related in Newbury and nothing else. Well, clearly he was a very high-class hurdler. He was. And he's performed well at repeated festivals. You mentioned Gallia de Lito and the way that she was fired into fences at Warwick. She was very good there. She was, and the real whacker won't be far away, so Jerry Kalama's not exactly going to take his time. This will be a slog. 
It will be. Let's have a look at the real whacker. This is his win in the dip. This is a real substantial performance over shorter, of course. He's stepping up in trip. I think that will suit him. Yes, uh, I thought he was good here. So November, December, I can't remember. January. Uh, January. No, he won before that as well, didn't he? Yes, he did, in yeah, November. November. Now, he obviously got Bo Port and Mon Morale in here, but look, he was gutsy, he was game. They held out the option of running him in the Gold Cup for a long time, and instead they've come here. And he, look, he's really is entitled to his place, and he's a, a very good horse. And I think stamina suits him. He's a solid jumper. And, um, yeah, look, he's a player. Third place, Thunder Rock. Goes out to his right, but he's staying on relentlessly here. He is, but I'd say the real whacker, we know he gets further, Lydia, and had to be committed to go and win the race early. If you hang on to the real whacker and don't commit him quite as soon, he probably wouldn't have tied up. Yeah. He was winning the race. I, I mean, Thunder Rock couldn't I, win it yet. I feel the same way. Uh, yeah. And I think he was advantaged by uh, going right handed at Sandown last time. It can be a bit exuberant, the real whacker. You wouldn't want to be overly so in this, in this race, I don't think. No. Prefer him to be a bit exuberant now than clumsy. Fair enough. Let's join Nick. Just down here outside the, the stabling area at Cheltenham with Cara Monaghan, who's looking after Gavin Cromwell's group of horses, good group of horses as well, of course, spearheaded by Flooring Porter, who's looking to make a little history in the stairs hurdle. Right, Cara, you've been over with this horse before, so you know when he plugs in. Yeah. Is he plugged in now for his important test? Uh, he is. Look, he came out, Keith Road went this morning, and he knew exactly where he was. He s settled down straight away. He did his piece of work. And we couldn't be more than happy with him. I know there's a lot of rain down, but we're not too worried about the weather at the moment, so we're under the ground conditions. And is it fair that, you know, he's a character and you do need to know him a little you bit do. to know when he's on song? Oh, definitely. He's so quirky. You never know what floor port you're going to get in the day. Like, he could be an absolute angel one day, and the next day you're like, oh, no, what, what way is he? But so, so far, so good. So, look, hope, we're hopeful, but you never know. It's a hot race this year, so it is. It's a very hot race. Now, Gavin gave me a pretty big steer yesterday on, on the Sunday show for a horse called Let's Be Clear About It, who runs in the Albert Bartlett. Yeah. Now, you've ridden him this morning. I rode him at this, oh, yes, I rode him at this morning, and yes, he's in great order. He absolutely pulled me around the field, so he did, but um, we couldn't be more than happy with them all. He's really in good order coming into this, and he's he's coming in fresh as well, same as Florent Porter. They're both coming in fresh to the run, so they are. So um, we'd be hopeful they're both going to run big races. See, the last time he did this to me was with Vanillier, <laughs> and he was a huge prize at the time. He was, yeah, and he's he's going now for the Grand National now in end of April. So look, all the horses are in good form. His last run in Fairy House is brilliant. Sure, he came second and only beaten half a length in Fairy House. So look, Vanillier got his jumping right now. Hopefully he goes on to the Grand National and does a good job. And apart from Florian Porter, and let's be clear about it, of your horses this week, which one do you like the best? Um, probably Florian Porter because of last year. But then um, Stumptown also has a great show in the Kimur. Uh Barry O'Neill, I think, is riding him in it. So, um, look, he's a good jockey on him as back. He's going to light the ground out there. So, hopefully. And for you to have been here with Florian Porter, with the ridiculous reception that he receives and the crazy following that he's got. What's that been like to be in the cauldron of that? Oh, it's been amazing. Like, God, you couldn't write what happened last year. It was amazing. Like, the phone calls, everything, since, even since it's happened, I'm still getting phone calls and being like, oh, you looked after phone for him. Like, yeah. And the boys are just brilliant, so they are. They always come down to the yard, make sure everyone's all right and everything. Like, they're brilliant crack. You know, you couldn't have even just, you can still remember it so well. Like, it's like it only happened yesterday, and it was amazing, so it was. I will never forget that. Oh, so if he does it three times, cause <laughs> those celebrations will be something else. So you've only got 72 hours to wait. Cara, best yeah. of luck this Thanks week. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks a million. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So we've saved the best of Wednesday to last, the Queen Mother Champion Chase. Let's have a look at the betting for this, shall we? It's going to be an absolute corker, I think. Um, sorry, it's the declarations, of course, for this. Apologies. Edward Stern is there with Enigam in. Uh, Gredity, Nubi Negra, Finamba Silva, Editor de Sheik, Captain Giddis. The one that's missing, of course, and we knew that, is Gentleman Demi, who unfortunately has an infection. We'll talk about the impact of his departure on the race in a moment. We start with the Clarence House, which, a bit like the Clarence House last year, has set up an intriguing rematch this time around. It has, and isn't that the beauty of it? Look, Editor de Geet jumps out and goes here. Uh, Marilla Sky outside him. Uh, Funambud, was that Funambud of all down the outside? It was Enner Gamine, Edward Stone. They're pretty much all in here, Lydia. And look, I thought Niall Houlihan was brilliant on the front here. Paul Town elected to sit behind him and Enner Gamine, and then Tom Cannon sits off him with a target of Paul Townend's back. Unfortunately for Tom, Niall Houlihan increased it down the hill 
just as Paul Townend was looking to get a little breather on Edgar Green, and he's gone and it left the two of them with too much ground to make up but Edward Stone is the one that makes it up Edgar Green didn't he makes a mistake at the last because I think he can't go to his right which he likes to do but Niall Houlihan won this race yes it, more so than anything and I don't look I've said it a few times to me I would have ridden Edward Stone the way Tom Cannon rode him um, that's when you're only after talking to say you should do something else they look the right tactics going out but I do think he will change the tactics to, on Wednesday afternoon he does a lot of running to get there gets to him heads him and then can't hold on old course rather than the new course won the Arkle well last year I thought leaving here though the champion chase winner would win it again and I couldn't see the Arkle horse beating him but right now I probably can Yes, I can. On the basis of this, like you, I think it was a huge effort for Edison to get to the front, but Niall Hula had, had saved something with an exquisite ride on Editor De Geet. Let's start with Editor De Geet and think about the impact on him of Gentleman Domain not being there. Yeah, it's, it's obviously a plus for him, but Dunvegan took on Gentleman Domain at the Dublin Racing Festival and Gentleman sat inside him until Dunvegan settled down. So, look, you still have Captain Guinness and you will have full Ambu Sevilla who went hard at Newbury. So I still think there is plenty of pace in there. And also, Editor Zajit has shown his hand a bit more, hasn't he? And Niall Houlihan has shown his hand a bit more. Yeah, he probably has, but um, he's one way of riding him, and he's a really good record on the old course, too. Yeah, yeah I think he'll run well. He will. He'll, well. Run a, he'll run a big race. I just do think Tom Cannon will ride Edward Stone more like he rode him in last year's Arkell rather than in the Clarence House. First, we're going to have a look at last year's Queen Mother's Champion Chase, which was won by an Ergamen, but the race fell apart. Yeah, it did. I mean, it fell apart early when Shishkin was gone, and that was the end of him. Um, he was the big player. Obviously, he changed the tactics in Enogamine for Mascot. They'd swapped around to follow it, Shishkin rather than lead him. But this race, as you said, did fall apart. Envoy Allen down the inside, Shaq and Pursois. But he's home and hosed at this stage. That was really soft ground. Soft ground definitely is a help to yes. him. He does go a bit to his right. Um, but how much further could he have won on this occasion? Um, I know it's only when Venetia said it the other night in the show, I was thinking I must watch that again. He does hit the line strong, but he didn't come up there like sprint to Sacra on Mastermind. It's the right-handedness as well in the tighter roll course that bothers me. He goes out to his right, two out, which is the first fence after that left the hand turn. The only thing is, if it is testing tomorrow and it gets churned up by Wednesday... It might be help to be out there. A lot of people could be out there. Yeah, OK. Uh, it, that could be the case but again no you mentioned Edward Stone on the right hand side of him just not giving him room to adjust exactly right. yeah but if he gets to the if they're all out you won't be losing as much ground and when you look out on the track here it doesn't look to me to be railed like there'll be fresh ground on Wednesday over fences there is at the first two fences but no, after that there's not Let's have a look at Edwardston in the Arkle. He was very fresh as well in the Clarence House because he had unseated at Kempton earlier. Should we just overlook that unseat as, the, as these oh things yeah, can happen? That can happen to Edward. Look, right. Moscow Flyer. Uh, if you look where he is in the Arkle compared to where he was in the Clarence House, he's, he's further forward uh, in a good position and he absolutely bolts in. Beats Gabby Naco, Riviera de Tell, Blue Lord. I um, can't remember the great horse of Tizzers that's back in fifth, but Warlord. yeah, Warlord. Good call. Uh, but look, this was a good performance. But I think this horse has actually improved. Yes, so do I. Eight to nine. I didn't see it happening, but I think it has. Yes, so do I. I mean, he kicked Gwenatine out of the way in the single creek. Yes. Yeah, OK. Let's move on to the bumper, shall we, and have a look at the decks for that. And now on the BHA admin site, Patrick Mullins' name appears alongside fact or file and Paul Townend's against It's For Me, which was not what the betting, I think, would probably be expecting. No, and it's a weather play, the fact, uh, hand in that, Lydia. Obviously, your favourite was a dream to share of John Kiley's fact two file. Uh, ran him close, ran close enough to him at Leperstown. But I think, for me, the six-year-old softer ground I've always believed in the stayer winning the bumper over the speedster. And to me, the strongest stayer of those horses of willies of those ones is still fact two file. I think real slow ground could bring chosen witness into it. Chapo de Salil has to improve from his first run and be more professional about what he's going to do. Westport Cove and Western Diego aren't bad horses. Fun, fun, fun's a good mare. You've Queen's Gamble in there as well. Oh, look, it's a deep race. It is a deep race. It usually is. Right. We've gone through all of the four days and now it's time to hear who you think is the most vulnerable of the short price favourites. At the start of the show, we asked you that. Let's have a look at the results, shall we? Overwhelmingly, it is Galloping de Champ. They have not listened, Ruby. But look, I'd love to know who the 11% are that think Constitution Hill is. <laughs> is that not, the, mo is that not the, the more relevant question here? <laughs> it is, it really is. 
It really is. They're, they're, they're Please hopers. put your name on a postcard, <laughs> stamp the dress postcard, and we will reply. I think we've got a couple of reasonings. I'm hoping there's a Constitution Hill reason. Um, let's have a look. Okay, Helen, Helen Sheridan. She of the uh, Noble Yates. Excellent viewer's question. Do you remember with the tanker? No, no, no Ruby doesn't remember. It was a brilliant. Anyway, Joe, the Gold Cup has the potential to be grungy. Could be one for the heavyweights rather than a slick cruiserweight like Galloping Sean. And the next is from Matt Jones. Shishkin, soft ground and a big crowd will be the undoing him yet again. Blue Lord all the way. It's what? Big, the big crowd really bothered him. He won here before, didn't it? Does he, does, he doesn't mean the race? The, the size of the field? I anyway, I'd, sorry, Matt, not following your logic there. Six, right. That is 68,000, definitely. That's the problem. Let's go um, and have a quick chat with Nick. Nick, thank you so much for getting all of those interviews during the course of this show. What do you think was the most th interesting thing that you learned? Without doubt, the answer David Casey gave when I asked him which horse was really making his heart pump this week, and without a blink, he said Ampere Pass. And then he showed me his working as we walked on to go and see the horses. That was the most interesting thing, I thought. And I got the passion from Cara Monaghan about what it's been like looking after Flooring Porter from here at Cheltenham and the palpable excitement uh, that she's uh, had here looking after the, the Gavin Cromwell horses. It's also incredibly windy, as you know. Uh, the ground is drying out a bit, but there is some rain still forecast. I don't think we're going to be much quicker than soft by the time of the opening race. The one thing that struck me though, Lydia, coming down for the first time off the old course to this final hurdle was this, the white, of course, the new uh, white instead of orange for these hurdles. And I'm, you know, I'm just struggling to know where to take off here. You know, do I, do I take off here? Do I come back here? Do I go through here? Oh, Annie Power. Thank God we couldn't hear anything yeah, he I know. said. Uh, but uh, obviously there was a dig at the end there to me about any power anyway. So thanks, Nick. Look, I'm sure you're off to California or somewhere where the weather is nicer than where we are. I mean, we, we, we couldn't hear a word of what Nick was saying. I was hoping that you could all hear it at home. Literally, the only thing we heard was the words, any power. Yeah, and he'd fall on top of the last hurdle. You're... <laughs> Thanks, Nick, look. <laughs> thank, you, thank, thank you very much for, for your contribution. Um, dangerous thing to uh, mention i would say when you've got four days uh, in our company anyway thank you very much for watching road to cheltenham i hope you have enjoyed our preview and that we have whetted your appetite for the four amazing days ahead don't forget to tune in for our wrap every day and tune in 10 a.m every morning here on racing tv goodbye We're giving away more free bets than ever before get a free bet on any race on tuesday wednesday and thursday Watch live racing now on RacingTV.com.